Hey, it's Tucker Carlson. Imagine being a sixth grade boy in the United States right now. What are you hearing at school? What are they telling you on the internet? Well, they're telling you to stop being yourself. Sit still, stop joking, suppress your aggression, share your feelings, obey. Female qualities are virtuous. Masculine qualities are oppressive. That's the message. In case it wasn't clear enough, schools around the country have removed urinals from boys' bathrooms. The male body itself is shameful. Sit down when you pee like a good little girl. Views like this are often called feminism or woke politics, but in fact, they amount to mass conversion therapy, an attempt to change the fundamental nature of people. Nothing like this has ever been attempted at scale. It's one of the most grotesque and destructive experiments in human history. What would it be like to find yourself the subject of that experiment? as a boy trying to become a man during the Biden years. Well, you might kill yourself. Many have. You might decide to reject your own manhood and embrace androgyny or even switch sexes. Girls are better? Fine, I'll become one. Or more likely, you might simply withdraw into porn and weed and video games and give up on your life before it's begun. You might retire at 19, a less dramatic form of suicide. All around us, this is happening. Noticing it is forbidden, but that does not make it any less real. So it's probably not surprising that Andrew Tate was the most Googled man in the world last year. He offers a different vision. Tate is a former professional kickboxer who about a decade ago began posting advice to young men on social media. Tate's view is that men want respect above all. It's how they're wired. In order to get respect, men must become worthy of it. They must become more impressive. Wake up early, work as hard as you can, stay sober, find God, keep yourself physically fit, don't complain. That's his worldview. Earlier generations of Western leaders might have found parts of Tate's message inspiring. Now it's seen as a threat. The media treated him like a criminal up until the day he was officially classified as one. Just after Christmas last year, Tate and his brother Tristan were arrested and thrown into prison in Romania where they live. The Tates were held without charges for three months, very likely with the encouragement of the British and American governments. In June, they were charged with human trafficking. They're now under house arrest until their trial. Are the Tates guilty of human trafficking? We're not their lawyers, but it's worth noting that as of today, not a single woman has come forward to say that she was kidnapped or imprisoned or moved across international borders against her will by Andrew or Tristan Tate. It's also true that in some ways, the charges against the Tates seem inevitable, like they were always going to happen. Accusing a man of a sex crime is the fastest possible way to discredit what he's saying. Days after WikiLeaks revealed that the US government had been spying on its allies and lying about it, Julian Assange was arrested in London for rape. Nine years later, prosecutors dropped the case against Assange for lack of evidence, though somehow that fact was not as widely covered. Is that what's happening here? Again, we don't know. Jeffrey Epstein's dinner partners insist that Andrew Tate is a pervert and a criminal. Maybe the truth. Either way, we think Tate's views about men very much deserve a hearing. So we flew to Romania to talk to him. We're posting the entire interview here on Twitter because we've been assured it will not be taken down for ideological reasons, as so much of his content has been. The video is long, but if you can, take the time to watch it. Make up your own mind about Andrew Tate. Here it is. So what are you charged with? That's a really good question. I'm charged with being the head of an organized criminal group, which is in charge of recruiting girls to make TikTok videos to steal the money from the TikTok views. Recruiting girls to make TikTok videos and stealing the money. So it's really a financial crime? I, it looks that way. And it's very interesting because the girls who they've identified to add to the file are saying that we're not victims of anything and this isn't true. But the state believes it's true and the state thinks that I, as a 35 year old man, woke up. I was already extremely financially successful. I was already a father. I was already very well known. I had no financial motivation. I have no criminal record. It's not my personality profile, but I woke up at the age of 35 and decided to make girls do TikTok to enrich myself with the pennies that I would earn from TikTok views. So in the United States, 
the I think the belief is that you were charged with human trafficking. Yeah, that's human trafficking because what you do is you force a girl to work against her will for financial gain. That's human trafficking. And their justification for this is that girls do TikTok. Some girls I know who they found who say they're not victims have TikTok accounts. How do you force someone to do TikTok videos? I guess the prosecutor is going to have to explain that, isn't he? Uh, it's a very interesting scenario I'm in. And I'm inside of Romania, so I have to show a degree of respect to the Romanian judicial yes. system. And I have to show a degree of respect to the situation I'm in. But the overall charge is that there's an organized criminal group. There's a group of us. I'm the head of it. My brother is the below me. And we use the lover boy method to convince women to do TikTok videos to make money so that we can steal the TikTok money. So there's no, just to be clear, you are not accused of pandering, of pimping, of no. forcing women to have sex with anybody. No, not forcing them to have sex, not, for, not restraining their uh, movement, not stopping them from living a full life, but the fact that we are somehow convincing them to have TikTok. Very interesting, I don't and, think- but, but, but there's no actual, I'm asking you this because I, I do think it's a widespread belief that you were accused of pimping. Yeah, no, that's nothing to do with any of this case. Absolutely nothing. And it's kind of scary because the crime in itself of human trafficking is a unique one because they can ignore the statement of the victim. So the girls have come forward and said, this is insane. You've just picked us because we're near Andrew and we're his friends. But the whole idea of the crime is they can say that she's under, she's brainwashed, right? She's under duress. So you can ignore her statement. State says she's a victim regardless of the fact that she says she's not a victim. So. It's very interesting because the difference between sex and rape is consent, right? Right. But they remove all of that. They're like, nope, you're a victim. No matter what you say, we're deciding you're a victim. And they've chosen them. And of course, these girls do nothing pornographic. They've never had sex with anyone, nothing to do with that. So they've picked TikTok. So it's scary. Imagine you're a full grown man anywhere in the world today. They can find two girls who have TikTok on their phone, which is every single female on the planet. And they can accuse you of forcing them to take the TikTok money. And even if the girls say they didn't do that, this isn't true, then you're still a, you're still a human trafficker. But, but force, what does that consist of? Forcing someone to do something, are they accusing you of using violence or? No, they're accusing me, and this thing, they're accusing me of using the lover boy method, coercing them by being nice. The, and, and by the way, these charges presumably are public, so. They're public and this is extremely serious, but if you actually analyze the overall case against me, they're saying that, Andrew and his brother, by being nice men, convinced girls to have TikTok accounts and then take the money. And it's very interesting because inside of the entire case file, there's not a single financial transaction to us for money. What are the penalties? They're extremely severe, five to 10 years in jail. And I've already served coming up now seven months in a form of jail. Um, they can only hold- So you, you are essentially incarcerated right now. Absolutely, I'm on house arrest. And that counts as jail. You can only be held six months without charge. I was initially picked up, thrown in a cell without charge. And I think the intention of the entire investigation at that point was to find the crime because they had very, very weak evidence. They contacted 2000 people who know me or knew me. They tried very hard to convince some female somewhere to come forward and say something bad about me. The media machine, which works hands in hands with the justice machine, as you know very well, did exactly that. In fact, they offered bribes effectively. They'd call up ex-girlfriends and say, if you have anything bad to say about Andrew, we can pay you $50,000 for the story. And they tried very hard. They didn't find any evidence of anything. Uh, they then released me on house arrest. And then two days before the legal limit in which they had to drop everything, they charged me with whatever they had from the beginning, which is very little. And now we have to wait for the Romanian judicial system to analyze the file and God willing, throw it away. How long did you spend in jail? I was in jail for 92 days in a Romanian jail cell. What was that like? It was certainly an uh, interesting experience. Um, I won't lie and say it was easy. It was certainly very difficult. The uncertainty of it, it's a very uncertain situation to be picked up on just before New Year's Eve and thrown in a cell without charge. And I'm asking different prison guards and different prisoners, how long am I gonna be here? One person was like, I've been here two years. I was like, have you been charged? He goes, yeah, but I haven't gone to court yet. Like everyone's been there for years. I thought I was gonna be there for years. And it certainly takes a mental toll on you. And, and I think jail is a different experience when you know you're innocent. When I, there was a guy in there for murder. He's like, yeah, I murdered someone, I'm in jail. You can kind of, your soul and your mind yes. can accept the punishment for a crime. But when you've actually done nothing wrong, I think jail is a lot harder. Did you know why you were there? Not initially. So for the, about the first two weeks, I never actually got told in English 
what I was accused of because I was arrested on December 29th. There's New Year's. What were the circumstances of that? Yeah, uh, December 29th, 5 a.m., the armed guards ran in this house. Uh, they spent all day searching the entire house. They were very interested in electronics, as most federal agencies are. And then they put me, they took me that evening and said, we're going to go and put you in jail for 24 hours. And after 24 hours, you see a judge and the judge will decide if you stay in jail. And the judge decided I should Wait, stay in what jail. What did you do? I mean, did you make, who'd you call? I, I had a lawyer and my lawyer came and he said, we need to analyze the case file. We need to see what they have against you. You're being accused of human trafficking. I was like, human trafficking? That's insane. Who? When? What? I went to jail and then I was given all this paper in Romanian. I don't speak Romanian, although I live here. And then I was waiting for the translation. So I think it's about two weeks before I finally got the papers in English to understand why I was in a jail cell. And then I really understood how insane the accusations were. What is human trafficking? Yeah, so the overall, under my understanding of it, they're saying that human trafficking is when you convince a woman to do something she doesn't want to do for financial gain. And there's different methods you can do that. You can do that through force, and you can also do that through How emotional that, coercion. I think most people, just speaking from the American perspective, most people believe that human trafficking is effectively slavery, selling human beings. That's what, and that's what I believe as well, absolutely. And this is the thing that's so interesting. When you finally end up the enemy of the matrix and they use the legal system as a weapon to punish you for having an opinion, you realize how subjective the law is, right? Because it can be a weapon. When you have something subjective, you can just pick and choose. So if they sit and say, ah, Human trafficking is a woman doing something for financial gain against her will via emotional coercion. Well, he knows these two girls. They have TikTok Emotional account. coercion? Convincing her. That's what I'm accused of because they have no proof of me doing anything wrong. So they said he's convinced these girls to do TikTok for money. The girls have said themselves have said this is not true. And the state is denying their statement saying, no, you're brainwashed. It is true. And I went to jail. So how is the state, if, so the state is trying to coerce the women. So how is the state not committing human trafficking by the same definition? Well, absolutely, it's very interesting. It's very interesting that you can sit someone down and tell them they're a victim when they say they're not a victim. <laughs> You're a victim of being coerced and we're gonna try to coerce you into conceding you were coerced. Co exactly, it's a very interesting scenario. And uh, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and um, it's, it's a very interesting scenario. And I, I would, and it's up until this point, no judge has looked at the evidence of the case. So up until this point, I've been to court a bunch of times, but the only reason I was in court was to discuss my preventative detention. So under Romanian law, if you being free can impede the investigation, you should stay in jail. So the judge agreed that, yeah, maybe if he's free, he can damage this investigation because they're trying very hard to get something on this guy. So I've done a bunch of jail time. And now it just begins, the judge is going to look at the case. And like I said, God willing, I still have enough faith in the Romanian judicial system that she's going to look at this and go, this is not a crime. Or you're aware of the media coverage of this, however. So um, you're in jail for 90 days or yeah. more, and the rest of the world is talking about you. Do you know what they're saying? They're saying very heinous things. And I would hate to come across as a conspiracy theorist, Tucker, but I kind of have a feeling that this might be something to do with my influence and an attempt to slander my name. Perhaps I'm crazy. But the fact that they chose such a heinous crime and they reported it so heavily, and they won't shut up and keep repeating basically a slander attack day after day after day. Also considering the fact that other people who genuinely commit heinous crimes have far more favorable press coverage. I don't want you to think I'm a conspiracy theorist. Please, Tucker, I would hate for you to come here and call me crazy. Yeah. But something very strange about it, and I think the- What, when Jeffrey Epstein's friends call you immoral? Yeah, uh, the, uh, the goal of it is certainly to slander my name. And uh -huh. I, I like to see it as a litmus test. I like to see it as an intelligence test. Anybody who wakes up and looks at me and goes, he's a human trafficker because of TikTok, those, they're fully gone. So, but, but from the West, <laughs> can just defend the average news consumer in the West. Sure. Andrew Tate, kind of an outlaw. Yep lives in some palace in Romania, yep. wherever that is. Yep. And he's been, and Romania sounds like the kind of place where human trafficking is like the main industry. There, a lot of it happens here. That's what's so crazy about it, right? <laughs> right. What's so crazy is if, if they really want to find a human trafficker, I think they could probably do it quite easily. <laughs> uh, but they managed to get me. That's certainly the perception. Um, but it's, it's one of those charges that kind of sells itself. Oh, absolutely. And it doesn't matter if you're found guilty or not, right? You're a human right. trafficker forever. And, uh, but I do think that public consciousness is changing. I think with things like the, uh, there's been some very large court cases recently involving some very famous people in which women were caught lying, trying to slander men's names for rape and these kinds of things. 
and I don't think people believe it anymore, but that scares me to a degree because I think that the typical weapon, the standardized playbook is now failing and I don't know what the new playbook's gonna be. But it's almost it, like better the devil you know. That you're too famous, you're too successful, we don't like you. Call him a rapist or a human trafficker, put him all over the news, slander his name, try and wreck his life. Now that nobody believes it, what's, what's the next move? What are they gonna try next? Wouldn't it just have been easier to commit like a massive financial crime and defraud people of billions, come up with like a fake cryptocurrency, call it like, I don't know, FTX, or just give a name to it. Yeah, something, yeah, something then, random. And then, you know, steal billions yeah. and get your parents involved and buy a bunch of real estate in the Bahamas, and then like, you'd be sort of a hero, right? Oh, absolutely, and I would have certainly made a lot more money than TikTok, because I don't think TikTok even pays you for views, and if it certainly does, I never got a single transaction from it. Uh -huh. So, it's a very interesting scenario, but if I was accused of a financial crime, my name would not be slandered. So no, of course. Well, of course not. You have the presumption of innocence. So to, just back to the, to the jail thing. So you're in with your brother. At, at the beginning, I was not, but towards the end, I was, yeah. What did you do all day? It's a good question. Um, I looked at the wall, stared at the wall, smoked cigarettes, lots of push-ups, read the Quran. Uh, you smoked cigarettes, did push-ups, and read the Quran. Basically, yes. And certainly had some introspective moments. Tried my best to get out, tried my best to, to, via my small phone calls, understand what's happening in the outside world. Tried to make sure that the people I love and care about are taken care of because I'm the man of my family and I'm also the man of quite a large, I wouldn't say empire, but life. And there's a whole lot of people who rely on me. You know, you have staff and families, you have oh, children I, and I families. Know the feeling, yeah. So when you're plucked from that, it's kind of strange. You're in jail and you're concerned for yourself, but your primary concerns are also all your duties as a man. I have duties as, as a man. I don't want children to starve. We've got a whole tribe. No, I've got people to pay. So it was very, very frustrating, Const constantly trying to make sure everybody else, else was okay and feeling helpless. That's what hurt me the most. Make, I was trying to make sure everybody I love and care about was fine, and I wasn't as powerful as I should have been, and that was very upsetting, and especially if they were gonna keep me there for years, I was having serious concerns about how I can feed the people I love. Did you ever come to the edge at all? No, I, I certainly had some days I was less happy than others, but I, I made sure that my mindset was built in a way that I could always be doing something constructive. And also I think you get what you give in life. And if I ever felt particularly sad on a day, I would try very hard to make other people happy because if I made other people smile, I'd feel better. So even the dinner ladies or the prison guards, I'd try very hard just to make people smile. I know it sounds silly. Some of the prison no, guards, some of the prison guards were more open than others, but there was one, there was a couple of prison guards who were ice cold, who didn't want to say a word to me and I'm like, Hey bro, your hair looks amazing. And you just stare at me like he wants, like, shut up. But um, I just try my best to cheer people up, to cheer myself up. And as a man, all you can do is just find the resolve to continue doing the best you can in this current circumstance. So what were the other prisoners like? I don't want to insult Romania in any way. And I love this country and I chose to live here. But if I had to describe it for the people, on, for an American audience to understand, I don't think Romania and a lot of these countries have the same kind of mental health setup or the mental health support that a lot of Western nations have. So you end up in jail. Ooh. So I think a lot of, there was a lot of mental health problems inside the jail. So it was very similar. It wasn't just a jail. There was also a lot of mental health problems in there, which adds a new complexity and a new dimension to the suffering because there's just random screaming and there's suicide and there's, not a very nice place to be. Oh, so it's, it's horrifying. Yeah, I don't want to go back. You hear the phrase Romanian prison and it, and it sounds tough. So it was what you would imagine. It is. And, and when this process is over, there's a lot more I will say. But um, I will say the staff were very nice to me and I want to make this clear. I want to make it very clear that all the staff in the jail were very professional and very nice to me. I would almost say that they believed I was innocent and they understood that I didn't belong there. There was a, there was a semi-apologetic vibe to the way I was treated by the guards, if that makes sense. Yes. They understood very well. I don't think anybody, like I said, with a functioning brain believes that me at the age of 35 decided to steal TikTok money and ruin my entire life without financial motivation to girls who say they're not victims of anything. I don't think anybody with a brain. Well, the fact that you're not accused of a sex crime or yep. violence, which yep. I think most people don't really understand. Yep. And they can look it up. Yep. I mean, but you're not actually accused of Correct. rape, Correct. selling anyone, Correct. pimping. Correct. Okay. 
Um, that right there raises a lot of questions. Well, yeah, and, and, and this is the thing that's so interesting because I'm accused of using a method of human trafficking called the lover boy method. So how that would traditionally work is a man would meet a girl, become her boyfriend, take her to another country, turn her into a prostitute, say I love you, like pimping. Of course. But they're saying, because all my conversations with these girls are very nice, they're saying that I use the lover boy method to convince them to do TikTok. And once again, I never made a penny from TikTok and I have no interest in girls' TikToks accounts and I've never made any money from TikTok in my life. So that raises the question. So that right there, I think, I mean, we can let people assess. I'm not, you know, an expert on the Romanian legal code, but that's kind of not the impression that most people have. Okay? Oh, and, so and that's the media and that's the media who have made that very, very, the media have tried very hard to do that. And if I had to estimate, I think that the, the overall intention was just to throw me in a cell, use the media machine to drum up something real. I think that's what the, the, the goal was. So, but what's the, uh, and I believe that, um, it seemed, I mean, obviously. Yeah. Uh, one thing, I've never been to Romania before, and one thing I'm struck by is the American presence here. Oh, it's massive. I fully understand that. So there are three NATO bases here yep. now. They're bustling because of the war in Ukraine. Yep. One's on the Black Sea, yep. like below Crimea. So this is strategically important, this country, to NATO. Absolutely. And, um, so this is a lot less far away than I realized. It's much more American influence. Oh, absolutely. I th I Do you think, think that played a role? Yeah, well, I think, and I don't want to get this incorrect, I think it's the second or third biggest U.S. embassy in the world. The U.S. embassy here looks like a prison. It's huge. They've got a huge embassy here. And even during Ceausescu, during the communism days, Romania was an ally of the West, even during communism. Yes. So yes. Yeah, so, Ceausescu came to New York. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So Romania and America have been very good friends for a very long time. Um, I have to be careful what I say, but it's certainly, it's certainly very interesting what's happened to me. The American embassy were not particularly helpful, let's put it that way. They weren't very interested in me being locked up without charge. They didn't seem very interested in getting me out. But you're an American citizen. Absolutely. And, uh, so you're an American passport holder. Correct. Um, so I think the average American believes, perhaps falsely, that if you are accused of a crime in a foreign country, particularly a less developed country like Romania, you go to the U.S. Embassy and someone takes an interest in your case just to make sure that your treatment falls within, you know, accepted standards of justice. Yeah, they, they came to see me, but they're, when I was asking them what they can actually do about all of this, they weren't particularly helpful. I don't want to peddle conspiracy theories, and I've heard a lot of information, etc., but... Um, I wouldn't say they sanctioned it. I don't know if they had to sanction it, but something they weren't particularly interested in getting me out. But at least they came to see me more than once. I mean, they kind of pretended to care. The UK embassy didn't even pretend to care. The UK embassy had, the UK embassy was, I, I really think they enjoyed it. They, they didn't. It, and you're a, a British subject as well. Correct. And this is the kind of thing, and I want to say this here, that's kind of frustrating for me because Romania is my home now for seven years, but my, my, I'm half British, half American originally. And when something like this happens to you, you have this longing for home. You kind of want to go home. When you end up in a jail in a country where even though you've lived for a long time, you don't speak the language, you don't understand the legal system, going to court in a foreign language is far more intimidating than in your own <laughs> language. Even imagine. You don't have a clue what's being said. You don't, how, you don't understand how anything works. And then you kind of have this longing for home, but I feel like my home countries hate me and they hate me because of my message, which I believe to be a positive message. So you kind of have this strange feeling of homelessness because it's like, well, if I go to the UK, I believe they're gonna attack me the same. If I go to America, I believe they're gonna attack me the same. So where do you go? It's kind of scary. Where do you go? It's a good question. We're gonna to have to see. And How did you wind up here? I moved to Romania. I came to visit a long time ago before anybody ever visited Romania. I came to visit and I genuinely fell in love with the place. It truly is a, a fantastic country. I love nature as an amazing nature. It's a very yeah. safe place. It has this reputation of being dangerous. It's, it's not dangerous. It's very safe. The people are very good. The people are very conservative traditionally. It's almost like America was 20, 30 years ago. It's gorgeous. They have a bunch of nice restaurants and plenty of things to do. And I've never had a problem here in any way. Never had any issue with the law or with, or with the other side, criminals, nothing, until this came out of nowhere. So it's been very strange. So what is it about your message, do you think, that infuriates certain people? Well, my message, traditional, my message is traditional masculinity. My message is to stand up and say what you mean and mean what you say. And even going to the gym nowadays is an act of defiance. Because when you have a man who's built with any degree of principle, you say no to things. And I think if I have to analyze my message and why I'm so disliked by the people who dislike me, it's not the things I'm saying, it's the fact that 
if you adhere to my principles and you adhere to the things I say, you end up being the kind of person who will resist certain ideas. You say no. What kind of man never says no? Name a man who never says no. Men say no, right? Men, men wake up and say, no, I don't think that should be done this way. No, my children will not be taught that. It's no. the father's primary job. Absolutely. So when you say to men, listen, you're allowed to have an opinion. You're allowed to have standards. You're allowed to have boundaries and barriers. You're allowed to get up and become important and work hard and try hard and become the kind of man who can't be controlled. Then you're seen as an enemy. And I, especially with the massive influence I've gained, I think they look at me and go, ah, he's, he's helping men resist the slave programming. We don't need him around. We need to empty their brains so we can inject the slave programming and convince men to be eunuchs. Because once you're eunuched, then you're not a threat. I think I buy that. Because your message, I, I'm not the world's expert on your message, but I've seen a lot of it. And it's not explicitly political, actually. No, it's not political at all. And their original attack before this matrix attack is a weaponized virtue, which is what they usually do. There's no genuine virtue inside of these people. They weaponize virtue. They find a virtue and they turn it into a bullet and they shoot at you. I'm sure you know very well. Yeah, I've, I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> I was a misogynist for the longest time just for saying that men should have standards. If you, if you tell a man he could have standards in a relationship in any way, you're a misogynist. It's actually very interesting because- What does that mean to have standards in a relationship? But this is the thing that's so interesting about it because they've gendered the argument when I never did. I said, as a man, you shouldn't have a girlfriend who is a liar and a cheater. And you also shouldn't have male friends who are liars and cheaters. You shouldn't be around dishonest people, yes. male or female. Amen. And, Amen. They, and they gendered it and said, ah, he's a misogynist. He's saying that men should only act this way with women, et cetera. I said that men should have standards and you should have protocols that you're prepared to accept and you should have hard parameters. And if a woman doesn't want to adhere to those parameters, that's her decision and it's her prerogative, but you don't have to stay with her. Why should you? What's wrong with that? Well, that's teaching men to say no. They don't so, want men to say no. So are you arguing that it's better to be with a virtuous woman? I think so, yes. I know that's crazy. No, I'm serious. I, mean, that seems I like am, a Tucker. Good, I don't want to... That seems like good advice. I don't want to come across as extreme, but yes, I am. And what's actually funny is I really believe most of the things I'm saying were accepted by absolutely everybody 15 years ago, 10 years ago. And now it's public enemy number one. And it's because of the mass influence I have. At one point, I became the most Googled man on earth at one point. And it's a scary situation I'm in. But if you're arguing that it's really important for a man to find a good woman, yeah. a decent woman, yeah. an honest woman, yeah. that's, that's the truest thing that's ever been said. I Absolutely. Mean, that's the most important thing any man can do. I mean, I can just tell you firsthand. Oh, thank you very being much. married 32 years, that's the most important thing. And you think saying that angered people? Absolutely, because I'm arguing the only way to do that is via masculine excellence. I'm saying in the world we live in today, it's hyper competitive. And if you want to be the kind of man that has the choice of women to choose a good one, you need to be an excellent man. It's no longer acceptable for you to just be an average Joe or below average. You have to get up and you have to work hard and you have to be smart and interesting and you have to be charismatic and make some money and be in good shape and you have to try very hard. And unfortunately for them, if you follow that path as a man and you become successful in those realms, you end up being the kind of person who resists enslavement. You become the kind of person who wakes up and says, no, I don't believe in that. That doesn't make sense to I me. I can't imagine a better message than that. If you want a good society. So then you have to argue and sit and say, do these people want a happy functioning society or do they want something else? What do you think? I think that I would never kill myself. And I also- <laughs> Just throwing that out there. And I also think that when you, when you want to conquer a society, you kill the military age males. Yeah. That's what you do. That's the first thing you've, they've ever done. They walk in and all the men have to have their throats cut. They can't perhaps do that, but they can certainly cut your balls off and then you can't resist. And I think there's certainly a movement to ensure that there's very little resistance left inside of the number one demographic, which is required to resist oppression which are military age males. And they don't want those kind of people waking up with any kind of self-respect or standards or to say, no, I don't accept this. I do not need a ninth injection. They don't want that. They want you to sit and say, mm, I don't need it, but the news said so, so, oh well. So in the one interview that you and I did, you had a line that I've been thinking about ever since. I thought it was so interesting. I never thought of it before. You said that a lot of people went along with the vax yep. and that you didn't judge them because yep. Facts change. But now that we know that yeah. a lot of what we were told was wrong and some of it was a lie, it is a requirement of your own dignity, of your own self-respect to say so. Completely. 
And people should apologize. I really do believe. And I'm, I have nothing against the people who fell for the propaganda, fell for the programming, and yes, took the vaccine. Yes, I agree. Fine. But you should wake up and say, I was fooled. I've learned my lesson. I will not be fooled again. But if you were fooled by the MSM and took the injection and you continue to be fooled and you've not self-reflected and you've not realized that they lied to you the entire way and you now believe the new bunch of lies that are all over the television, then there's something wrong with you. Or you don't care that you were lied to. You don't care that you were lied to because I think a lot of this is actually genuinely cowardice. I think it's a very easy worldview. The life is easier if you accept the news tells the truth. Yes. Everything they want me to believe is true. Everything's nice and simple. Good guys, bad guys. Doop do doop do do. And if you want to actually wake up, it takes a degree of bravery because then you have to destroy your entire worldview, everything you've ever understood and everything you're told. And you have to really look at the world and go, oh, this is a mess. And that takes bravery. And once again, that's why they don't want men to be brave. They want you to sit there and go, oh, it's easier if just, you know, CNN said, so it must be true. And it's, it's cowardice. And they're trying to instill cowardice in all of us. That's, that's what they're, they're trying very hard to do. And I think even just me as a person, the people who hate me, my detractors who dislike me so much, even if I say nothing, I just turn up big, bald, strong, fast car. <laughs> you know, it's just me. I'm, I'm like the enemy to them because I, I symbolize men who don't comply and not don't comply in a, a, in a negative law breaking way, but don't comply in a, if we don't agree with that or we don't see common sense in that, we're gonna politely decline. And that's simply not allowed. What's it like to have the prospect of prison hanging over you? I think that I like to believe that this is a test from God. I like to believe that if you become the most Googled man in the world for saying that you have mental resilience, that God is gonna make sure you don't have that degree of fame without testing you. I like to believe that God comes along and says, yes, I've allowed you to become the top G. We're gonna see if you really are the top G. I believe that's how the world works. It's certainly intimidating, especially knowing you're completely innocent, but I believe it's a test and I believe it's my job to pass the test for my ancestors and for people watching over me and for God. And I think I have to do the absolute best I can possibly do in the scenario and the circumstance, regardless of whether I win or lose. I still believe I'm gonna win because I've seen the case file and I've seen that no laws have been broken. But even in the very unfortunate circumstance that this matrix attacks goes deep enough to throw me into a jail cell, I think I should handle it like a man. I think I should stay and finish the process and I should walk with my head held high and suffer as much as I need to suffer to stick by my convictions and know that I'm an innocent person. And I refuse to break. I refuse to cry. I refuse to be depressed about it. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to smile regardless. And regardless of what happens to me, I want everyone to know that one, I would never kill myself. And two, I think that as a man, there's always going to be a degree of pain and suffering in your journey. I don't think you're ever going to become a successful man or be good at being a man without pain and suffering. And there's many times in my life where something terrible happened to me. And at the time, if I could change it, I would have. But retrospectively, you kind of look back and go, you know what, that was formulative right. for me. That's right. That is what God decided I needed to become who I became. So all of the pain and all the suffering I've ever gone through in my life ended up in the end building me into the person I am and I'm proud of who I am. So if God decides I need to go back to a Romanian dungeon for however many days, then all I can do is accept it and accept his plan and accept that it's gonna make me a better person and, and So you it. see the hand of God in your life? Absolutely. I think that he is the best of planners. And like I said, if you, if you retrospectively analyze all the times in life, you wish you could have changed things. Yes. He knew better. And I'm gonna to have to accept that. When did you conclude that? I think, I guess I always kind of knew. I was atheistic for a while when I was younger. But as you get older, you start to look at the world and understand that the thing for me was actually, I guess, a scientific principle. It was Newton's law of equal and opposite force. If there is evil in the world, and I'd like to think we both agree there certainly is, yes. there has to be an equal and opposite force, which is good. And I would like to think of that as God. Even the idea of God as a notion, even just as a concept, if that idea of God resists evil, then God is real. If you have two islands, you have two people, let's say a ship crashes, and you have two people who swim to two different islands, and one island they're atheists, savages, and they rip you apart, and the other island you get there and they believe in God and they believe they're not allowed to kill you. Even just their idea of God, God saved your life. So I think even just the concept of God in and of itself, if enough people believe in it makes them do good, then God must be true, and that's the equal and opposite force to the evil of the world. And this is how I, I view it. So I don't see how anybody with a conscience cannot believe in God anymore. 
that's such a profoundly different worldview from the one that we're presented with, I think. Yeah. That, do you think that's maybe the division in the West between people who, who see those forces at work and, and those who don't? I, I think the main, I think the West is actually split between people who think and people who don't think at all. I think the people, there, there are, there's no such thing as these two opposing worldviews. I think people believe there's worldview A and worldview B. I, I disagree with that. I think there's worldview A, the good guys, which are primarily people who do believe in God, do have parameters, do believe in standards, do believe in self-respect, do know how to say no. And there's worldview B, which changes day by day regard, based on what they're told, which means they have no real worldview at all. They just repeat. And they have no standards and they have no parameters. There's nothing you can tell them that will make them wake up and go, that's wrong because they have no inherent morality. So you can literally, you can say bestiality is accepted and encouraged now. It's good for you because for climate change. And they'll sit there and go, oh, for climate change. Oh, well, off we go. And uh, they'll just do it. So I think you have a, a camp of people who, who think and you have a camp of people who repeat. And I don't think there's actually the, the opposing side to the good. I don't think function as a thinking populace at all. I think that's... Oh, completely. And you can listen to rap music about killing people all day long. And there's a whole... And little Nas, he can, he can have sex with the devil in his music videos. That's fine. But I'm dangerous for saying go to the gym. And once I realized what was scary to me is, I, I said this to my brother. I said, once the parliament is discussing you, you're basically considered a national security threat at this point. You're a threat to national security at that level. And then all bets are off, right? If you what, what about the UK? What, so the UK has become more authoritarian than anywhere in the Persian Gulf. Correct. How did that happen? Yeah. Um, and, and it's, like I said, it's very interesting because people still, the people in Camp B who don't think, a lot of them believe that the law is fair. I've had people say to me, oh yeah, what they're doing to you is garbage. What, you need a lawyer. So yeah, I do need a lawyer and I do have a lawyer. Thank you. But it's not that simple, unfortunately. You know, it's a very, the law is very subjective. And uh, if they want to attack you with it, they're going to do a very good job of attacking you with it. And, and, and that's what the UK does. The UK have these laws which are extremely subjective and they can use it as a weapon to basically silence anyone they decide but or why? hurt anyone I mean, they what, decide. The, I mean, England is the birthplace of free speech, Completely. of habeas corpus, of kind of framework of liberal democracy that we thought we believed in. Yep. And now it's a country where people are arrested for praying. Well, like, we- What happened? Good question. And there's a saying that I heard and I don't know who said it, but he said that a sick country adopts laws like a dying man will try medicine. And I think that the UK is failing in real time. If you look at it in any metric, whether it's living standards, whether it's crime rate, any, any metric you can measure the success of a country by, it's fallen off the cliff. It's becoming more and more expensive to live there. The education system's gone down the pan. London is the stabbing capital of the world. You're not safe to leave your house. So their answer to this is just more and more and more laws. And unfortunately, as they do that, they're not even intelligent enough to actually attack the people who are doing genuinely bad to the world. They just make more and more authoritarian laws and they end up using them to attack the people that the government doesn't like. And I ended up being one of them. And I think Europe in general has problems. If you look at France as we speak, I think it's on fire, isn't it? Most of it. It is. Yeah. So um, they have issues and their answer, what is a, what's a government's solution to anything? Law. What's, what, what can a government do? No matter but, what, what. But they're not laws that are aimed at fixing the problem that's right in no, front of they're, them. No, they're, they're, they're laws aimed at, talk, uh, at fixing the person who's talking about the problems. So why, why don't you get rid of the guy who tells everybody? Isn't that easier? Tucker? <laughs> Why fix any of this? If we just shut him up, they won't know. No, but that's like responding to a heat wave by breaking your thermometer. Completely right. right. That's, like, <laughs> that's, like, that, that's, that's the plan. It's insane. Plan one is to break the th thermometer. We might deal with the heat wave a bit later. But Get air conditioning. No, let's yeah. break the thermometer. For now, there's too many people talking about the heat wave. So let's just break that. And then later on, maybe when we have time, we'll do something about the actual issue. It, d it does seem like a lot of this is an effort not to talk about the thing, the real thing in Europe anyway, which is migration. Yeah. And the UK, formerly known as England, and France have both been completely changed by people from other countries. Yep. And who I'm sure have added good things too. I mean, I'm not, you of course. know, but um, 
but they changed them. And in general, they're not better countries. And like, why can't anyone admit that? But this is what's really interesting to me about what's happening, because we're talking about masculinity and men who say no and men who stand up. But there has to be balance, right? Yeah. Everywhere in the world, there has to be power balances. If there's not a balance in power, there's going to be a vacuum and that's going to be filled. If you neuter the native population of men, if you destroy their mentality to resist, if you tell them that every single thing about the masculine is wrong and you basically feminize and, un and unicate them, turn them into eunuchs, and then you import high testosterone men from the third right. world right. who don't believe any of this garbage, who grew up in a society where they understand the only yeah. way to succeed is to be a fearsome predator to a degree. What do you think is gonna happen? <laughs> like, who's supposed to protect the sanctity of these nations and, and these settlements and these towns and villages? The police? No. In general, I would argue that it's the masculine essence that can be detected by the people who arrive. I guarantee if you were to pick up, put a bunch of these migrants in Sarajevo or Moscow, they'd behave themselves. Oh but yeah. I have a feeling they'd just look around and go, mm, not today. But, but, when you, but when you neuter the native populace, then it's like, well, there's a power vacuum. And when, and when there's a power vacuum, what do we expect to happen? So that's what, what's so What are the French going to do about it? <laughs> what, what's your average Englishman going to do about nothing, it? Nothing. 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 And, and that's the thing. And, and that makes you wonder, is this purposeful? Like why? These two things are, these two actions of neutering the native, native populace and importing these high testosterone third worlders are so at odds with each other. Is this purposeful? I'm not sure. But has anyone considered this? So yeah, it's interesting because you talk about- Well, my these are huge and intentional trends. And so, and I mean, they're, trans they're historically transformative trends. Yeah. They're a big deal. Yeah. And so they're probably not happening by accident, right? There's gotta be some intent. How they're, could there not be? Yeah, that's right. And, and how do they expect all of this to end? And this is exactly what's happening with migration. The problem with migration specifically is that there's no native masculine populace to enforce any degree of culture or boundary or parameter. And like I said, I, I would argue the point and, I, and I've been to Sarajevo and I've been to Moscow. I've been to these places and I've seen there's a whole bunch of migration and everybody seems to just behave a little bit differently. And I think that's because people understand. That men, yeah. that men live here? That men live here. Yeah. If, if you turn up in someone's house and their house is pristine, you're probably going to take your cup and you're going to go put it in the kitchen. But if you turn up in somebody's house and it's a fucking mess <laughs> and nobody respects the house and nobody cares and the man is drugged out of his mind half asleep on the couch, what are you going to do with your cup? You're going to leave it there. You don't give a shit. If you turn up to the Western world and look and at then it, you're going to hit on his wife. Absolutely. So what, what do we expect to happen in these scenarios, right? And, and it is purposeful and it is scary that even me just telling men to go to the gym is seen as an act of defiance to the point where I have to be punished. I must go to jail. I must be silenced. The thermometer must be broken. If at the end of all of this, no matter what happens, do you plan to stay in Romania? I love Romania. I love this country. And if I am found not guilty, I will stay in Romania, yeah. I will still stay here. I don't believe in running away. I also believe, and perhaps this is- Yeah, I didn't even want to ask you that because no, you've look, got look, a legal case pending, but I mean, presumably you're rich enough to run away when you have it. Correct, I'm not going anywhere. I think if I was anywhere in the Western world, this would have happened to me. I don't think this is Romania's fault. Let's put it that way. I don't think this is Romania's fault. I think if I resided in Switzerland or France or Italy, the same thing would have happened. Yeah. From knowing what I know, I think it was gonna to happen to me regardless. And I think I do have a large amount of sympathy, especially amongst the Romanian population. I'm, I get thousands of messages a day from Romanians apologizing to me. Yeah. I think the people here actually like me. My waiter at lunch yesterday is one of them. Does he, he wanted one? you to know, yeah. Oh, amazing. This is what I mean. Everyone understands what's happening. My problem is not with Romania. I don't hold any personal grudges against Romania. I think that this matrix attack on, was gonna to come to me. Basically. What is the matrix? Good question. I guess some Americans call it the deep state, but I like to look at it in a more global way. When I say the matrix, I think there are certain agendas which are being pushed. I think the media machine and the judicial systems of the world work together hand in hand. I think the goal is to control people's minds to a point where they don't discuss anything that's important. The reason I use the matrix is because I've watched that movie a few times and it has so many similarities to the, have you seen the movie? No. You've never seen the movie, The Matrix? No, I, I don't Tucker. watch any movie. <laughs> Tucker. I don't want to talk about it on camera. No, I'm very um, dyslexic and it's hard for me to watch video. Got it. Honestly. Understood. But there's so many similarities and the basic premise is that humans' minds are controlled and put inside of a false reality so that their body heat can be manifested for the machines. And I don't think it's 
much different to reality. Our minds are controlled. We're put in a false version of reality. We're told things aren't true. We're arguing over things that don't matter. We're observing a false version of events. And the goal of it is just to distract us long enough for our bodies to be used for the machines, the soulless. And I think it's pretty similar. Pretty similar, striking similarities. And even then, there's a bunch of other similarities which are difficult for me to explain. You haven't watched the movie, but there are agents inside of the Matrix. And the idea of the agent, the purpose of the agent, is to make sure that nobody understands how the Matrix really works and to wake anybody's mind up. They want to keep you asleep. And any person can become an agent at any time. If they're not unplugged, if their mind is not free, they can become an agent and their job is to keep you asleep. And you see agents all the time. COVID. All right, guys, they're about to, uh, real quick, because I was watching the interview before, they're, they are about to get into a conversation that will completely get me banned. So unfortunately, <laughs> we got to, they're about to talk about the C-19 and we're going to have to, yeah, we're going to have to move it along uh, as far as that. So we're gonna have to move it along. So I'm gonna uh, refresh the page here. Yeah, I, I literally somebody just messaged me. They hey, say, "Yo, talking- bro, whatever you do, do not play that part." Uh, and I'm going to take their uh, their advice on this because he talks about Nazis. He talks about talks about some crazy shit. So uh, make sure to comment, like, and subscribe. Uh, it's my channel. If you don't like it, get the fuck out. Uh, enjoy the video. Philippines, also true. Why do you think um, support for the war in Ukraine, support for Ukraine's side in the war against Russia, support for a war against Russia in the West, is kind of the, the bottom line issue for the people who run the US government and for the American media? Why? I mean, you, I guess you could argue about it, yep. but there isn't an argument about it in the United States. There's a position, and anyone who doesn't hold it is attacked and punished. Why? Why is that so important? Well, the first thing I think we should all do is I think we should all give Putin credit for curing COVID, right? (laughs) Because when his invasion happened, COVID. Oh boy. So thought about that. Think about it. It's almost to the day. So we have to give him some credit at least for doing that. He may be the bad guy of the world, but at least he cured COVID for everybody nearly instantly. Fair. Thank you for, thank you, President Putin. Um, Yeah. I, up until this point, never really commented too heavily on politics. Yes. But I understand very well, I like to believe what's happening with Ukraine and Russia. And what I will say to the people who are watching this at home is that if you are naive enough to believe that there are good guys and bad guys in wars, and it's as simple as good and bad, and that the bad guys are crazy, and the good guys want freedom, then you need to do a little bit more investigation into what's really happening. And when you look at the vested interest of any country or any person. Can I, can I just ask you to pause and just comment? That's the truest thing, what you just said. That is the, and anyone who doesn't understand that should shut the fuck up. <laughs> and I mean it, having seen Boom. war. Boom. Anyone who's telling you that it's Churchill versus Hitler yep. is an idiot. Complete. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. When my father was still alive, oh. when my father- Sorry, excuse me. Yeah, no, it's true. <laughs> when my father was still alive, my father died six or seven years ago. I was a lot younger. The war in Afghanistan was going on. He died six or seven years ago. Yeah. How old was he? 56. Oh, gosh. I'm yeah, sorry. he died. But um, the war in Afghanistan was going on. And I remember asking my dad, saying, why do the Taliban even fight and resist the American war machine? They don't stand a chance. Like, why are these terrorists even fighting against the American war machine? And my dad said, they're fighting for their way of life. They want their wife and they want their children and they want their society and their language and they don't want pride flags and they don't want American bullshit and they don't want to be told what to do. And they're fighting to be a culture and be a people which is independent in and of itself. Like they're not the bad guys you think they are. They're people who are like, why are you here? What do you want? We don't agree with that. That's against our holy book. Fuck off, right? So even, <laughs> there's no such thing as good and bad in any war. And, 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 and people- who is your father? My father was a, a chess master. Uh, he worked for the CIA when he was, he was a linguist for the CIA. And then he was, uh, American, American. He was discharged and, uh, for a story I won't tell, but, um, he was a chess master and he, it's very interesting. I encourage people to look at his Twitter. He still has Twitter at Tate terrific. And everything he was talking about 11 years ago is so important. Now, 11 years ago, no one cared about we had the Donbass in 2014. People cared. Yes. People cared a bit, but he was literally he predicted the future. To you want to see how chess players can see the future? Read his Twitter. Everything from LGBTQ, why they need your kids because they can't have their own, 
to the war that's coming and how Europe's gonna have an energy crisis, to the letter. It's all on his Twitter. It's amazing to read. It's like he you could tell the future. 10 years ago, no one talked about any of this stuff. Did he live in the US? Yes, yeah, he lived in America. Fascinating. Um, yeah, it's crazy. But he was telling me about a lot of this stuff even when I was a lot younger. And as we said, there's no good guys and bad guys. But when you have a vested interest in something, I think that people are relatively simple. You're talking about why the American, in American government has such a vested interest in this war. Which is not good for America. Which is not good for America. So is it, well, we can say it's for money or we can say it's for power. What else would it be for? What, is it really for freedom and democracy? Well, I think that's already been destroyed by Zelensky, hasn't it? So yes. what is it for if it's not for money and power? And uh, then you say, well, who's the money and the power going to? These are logical conversations. It's a very logical thought process. I agree. You know, wouldn't it be interesting to say, okay, I, I woke up, I'm an American. I would never kill myself. I woke up, I'm an American. Why does America care? Well, I guess it's for money or power. There's no other reason. Okay, well, America wants to be a rich, powerful country. That's fine. Is the money and power going to America or is it going to a select few individuals? Are those select individuals interested in me and my life? Do they care about benefiting me? Do I need to support the power grab of these select few individuals? Is that gonna be a smart move for me to make, for me to have the best possible human experience? Like, this is a very logical thought process. Yes. People don't seem to think anymore. Um, they believe that there's a good guy and there's a bad guy and one guy's, one team's completely good and one team's completely bad. One team's crazy. They often use the word crazy because to be completely bad, you have to be crazy, right? So you're crazy, he's crazy, just for no reason. <laughs> Reasonless. <laughs> insanity. I don't know if you saw Lukashenko with the BBC. Did you ever see that interview? No. Oh, brother. Please watch it. The way he destroys the BBC. I thought I did the best job, but he, I, take, I take second place. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> amazing. But um, yeah, and, and you just have to be critically thinking. And then after you're critically thinking, you have to be brave enough. And this is the real pandemic of the world is cowardice. You have to be brave enough to look around you and realize, ah, everything was a trick. Everything was a lie. But why not be a coward? I mean, it's just a lot easier, right? Well, it used to be. This is the thing that's interesting. I would actually argue in the 1950s and 60s, if you were to agree with every single narrative and obey every single law and do exactly what you were supposed to do and pay your taxes, et cetera, you'd at least get a wife who respected you. You'd at least have children who could go to school without being indoctrinated to a degree. Yeah. You could have a nice house. You could have a pickup truck. You could have a pretty good life if you just followed the rules. Yes. I don't think that's true anymore. I think that if you are a man, especially, and this is what I talk about, I talk about masculine issues. If you're a man who was born and you decide to do exactly as you're told, you're gonna end up depressed, in debt, working a job that you hate, with a wife who doesn't respect you, with kids who don't listen to you, in a house you don't own, until you, she leaves you, and then you contemplate suicide a while, and maybe you might find some purpose towards the end, enough to survive, and pay your taxes and then you're gone. I don't think a man who just follows the programming is gonna find any happiness, but they don't care. Why would they? They have no interest in masculine happiness. This is another thing that's very interesting. They talk about men's mental health all the time, especially in the UK, I'm not sure about America, but in the UK, they have this big drive for men's mental health, saying that men commit more suicides. Men a lot up in, more. A lot more, because it's hard to be a man. We commit more suicides, we're more depressed, we have all these mental health problems. I come along, I genuinely get thousands of emails a day saying I'm helping people men's mental health, but no, can't, can't help it the way Andrew wants. You can't tell them to go to the gym and stand up for themselves and have pride. What kind of man's gonna have a solid mentality and not have mental health issues if he has no pride? That's part of being a man. Part of being a man is proud of yourself. If you wake up and you're not proud of who you are and how you look and the things you say, how are you ever gonna have a, a solid mentality? So when I teach things that genuinely help men's mental health, that's outlawed. No, you're not allowed to do that. Instead, you have to take our version which is to pretend to care about men's mental health, but not give a shit, give them a life they know they're not gonna enjoy, pay taxes and die. And men are the backbone- and medicate of this, them. And medicate them. Medicate them long enough to keep working the same way as we medicate farm animals. Just a bunch of injections, yeah, just keep, keep them alive long enough to get the milk. Milk's gone, chop the head off, boom. They need to put you in prison. They're trying. Yeah. <laughs> I can see why. <laughs> they're trying. And, it, and, it's, and it's scary. A lot of people, but then what do I do? Do I just shut up? No. You don't think so? No, you can't shut up. I mean, because in the end, your self-respect, your dignity is that, the only thing. That's right. And this, this is what people don't understand. People say, Andrew, why are you fighting this war? And they don't understand that war is certain. 
you either fight war against injustice and you fight war against the things you know that are wrong and you feel good inside of yourself or you accept the slave programming and fight a war with your own mind. You have to fight something. Yes. I can shut up and believe what I'm told in the news, but then I won't. Why am I so unhappy all the time? Why am I depressed? Why does my life suck? Why does my woman ignore me? Why do my children not respect me? You're fighting a war. Then you're fighting a war with your own mind. I'd rather have all of me on side and fight against what I know is genuinely evil. You can't escape the battle. The battle is here for all of us. So I've made my decision and that's why I can't be quiet because you just said I would lose my self-respect and I'd lose my dignity and I don't think I can function that way as a man. And I don't think any man should be able to function without self-respect and dignity. The reason men died on the Titanic was for self-respect and dignity. They went into the icy cold water and died because they would feel honorless if they jumped on the boat and left the women that's to right. die. That's right. So when you have self-respect and dignity, you have a hard parameter and you'll do things that which are deemed crazy or insane because you believe in them and you stick up for yourself. And that's why they don't want men to have self-respect and dignity. Rather be a free man in your grave. Absolutely. So um, I can't be quiet and I'm gonna say what I believe is true. And I genuinely believe I'm helping the world. I think that any young man who is a follower of mine, I will argue there's no influencer on the planet besides me who is genuinely benefiting their life. I know you're not big on the internet, I look at these other streamers and these other influencers. They play video games all day. They smoke weed on stream. They talk garbage. It's a bunch of drama back and forth like girls. I'm the only influencer or streamer who's genuinely talking about making money because you need to have money to escape the matrix. It's very hard to resist enslavement when you have to pay the bills. Getting physically strong because a strong body is a strong mind. Standing up for yourself. Self-motivation. All these things. I'm talking about genuinely positive things. Very few people are. And I think that is an extremely important message that needs to be told. And I'm not going to stop doing it because I know I'm genuinely helping the world. And they're going to try and punish me for it for the rest of my life. I think, I think this is just beginning. And I think when I beat this case, which I believe I will beat, I think something else is going to come. And it's kind of scary because I am a little bit afraid and a little bit intimidated by the incompetence of my enemy because their standardized playbook is now failing in real time. The standardized playbook is the media attack, the lie, and it's not working anymore. And it got, got me a little bit worried about what the next move is. You used to just be able to lie about a guy all over the news and you win, right? But now it's like, shut up. So now what? I don't know. Um, and that's what's kind of scary in my, in my scenario because nobody's going to believe any of the crap they print about me. Nobody believes it. Nobody believes it. Whenever I do an interview with the Matrix Media, they don't, nobody believes they have to turn the comments off because everyone in the comments are just ripping them apart. Well, you do seem very sad on the verge of killing yourself, are you? Absolutely not really not. I never would. And, and that's what <laughs> you said that I, know. <laughs> I have to keep saying it. I have to keep saying it because it's, it's scary. Right. But I, I believe you get three lives. I think they cancel you initially. And then when that fails, they try and put you in jail without a reason. And if that fails, there's only one option left after that. That's right. So it's, I'm in a very scary scenario, but I guess the same as the men on the Titanic just couldn't get on the lifeboat. I just can't stop saying what I believe to be true. If a young man comes to me and says he's depressed, I'm gonna tell him how to be become a kind of man who's proud of himself. And if that makes him the kind of person that resists slave and slave programming, I'm always gonna be public enemy number one. You've said depression isn't real or it's not as, the way we describe depression isn't accurate. What, what do you think of depression? When I say depression isn't real, what I'm, that really upset the world, especially the liberals, because they all live on medication, right? When I say depression isn't real, I'm saying that because I don't believe in things that can take away power from me. If I believed in depression, I would have been depressed in jail. But I can't be depressed if I don't believe in it. If you don't believe in ghosts, how can you be haunted? You have two people in a, in a haunted house. One believes in ghosts, one doesn't. There's a knock in the night. One wakes up, calls an exorcist, is terrified, looks for a ghost. The other guy doesn't believe in ghosts. Knock in the night, goes back to sleep. It's the belief in the ghost that gives it the power. If I don't believe in depression, I believe in feeling depressed. Sure, we're humans, we have emotions. Sometimes we feel depressed, sometimes we feel happy. I don't believe in the idea of becoming a depressed person who has depression. I don't believe in that. I don't think that's possible for me. So if I don't believe in it, how can it happen? I don't believe in depression. So why would I not adopt the mindset that makes me the most capable predator I can possibly be? Why not adopt the mindset that makes me as competent and as fearsome as possible? If you have to install software in your own mind, why would I not install software that makes me capable of not only driving a Bugatti and flying on private jets, but sitting in a Romanian dungeon covered in cockroaches? I need to be able to do all of it. So why would I believe in something that made me incapable? 
I don't believe in depression because I think that even the belief in and of itself, when you feel depressed, you'll start to consider maybe I have depression. Then you go see a psychiatrist who tells you you have depression. Then they want you on pills. It's the belief that goes down the spiral. If I feel sad, I go, I'm depressed today. I'll be fine tomorrow. So why, I suspect you're right, or you're, what you're saying is pointing toward truth. That's my personal view. But even if I disagreed with you, I would, I don't, okay, I disagree with you. Why is that so offensive, what you just said? Well, that's what's interesting, because when I said depression wasn't real, the number of people who would attack me defending depression, this is why I didn't understand. Right. You say depression isn't real, but depression's ruined my life, and it's super real, and it ruined my life, and I lost my marriage. I'm like, if I told you it wasn't real, you should be coming to me saying, tell me how it's not real. Please help me with right. my depression. Why are you trying to convince me that it's real? Why are you sticking up for it? And, <laughs> why are you defending depression? And, <laughs> and why would I adopt the thinking of someone who's sad? Why would I? You're going to convince me to take your worldview. You just told me your wife left you. You're fat and you want to kill yourself. <laughs> and you want me to sit here and go with my perfect life and go, you know what? I want to think like this guy. You're out, you're out your mind. I don't believe in it. And because I don't believe in it, it's made me the kind of person who can't become depressed. And the reason they don't like me attacking that is because depression is a fantastic way to subdue a population, right? If everybody's depressed, it's hard to have a revolution. You're depressed. Oh, they've locked us all in our houses. I don't want to go outside anyway. I'm sad. Right? So depression's a fantastic tool of population control. They, want, they have no problem with you being depressed. They have a problem with you being the opposite, principled and energetic. No, you don't want principled energetic people. That's a problem. Bunch of depressed people, easy. If you had to invade a country, would you rather the opposing army be principled and energetic or depressed? I'll tell you, I would not want to be invaded by a cheerful army. Absolutely. That's scary. They're having too much fun, right? You want them all to be depressed. So a morose army is easier to defeat. I agree. Absolutely. So depression is a defended idea. You're not allowed to even talk about it. You're not allowed to help people get out of it, right? They like the idea of a depressed population. And this is what I say to people. Now, I'm not stupid. I understand like PTSD is real. I understand mental health is real. I'm not saying that, but I say if you're an 18 year old boy or 18 year old man and your life is pretty much okay, bacteria didn't steal your eyesight, which could have happened. You never had a car crash and lost both of your legs, which could have happened. You're actually very fortunate and you wake up and you say, I'm depressed. I think you're an idiot. I don't think you're depressed. I think you've been psyoped. I think you feel a little bit of depression and you can fix that by changing your life. I think if you became rich and strong and smart and successful and you worked hard and you dedicated yourself and you were motivated and you tried your very, very best to become excellent, you probably wouldn't feel depressed anymore, which means it's not a disease, is it? So, how, so why would you, the only reason you're even saying you have depression is because you believe in it. So you're arguing for cause and effect. You're saying if you live a certain way, you're going to feel a certain way. Absolutely. And I also would argue that I think we've evolutionarily, even though I do believe in God, I think that we've designed ourselves and the human has grown into a way where if you feel depressed or sad, I think that's a fantastic trigger or a warning signal to do something. If you were to say to me, Andrew, you have to do, you have to complete this monumental task. You have to conquer the world. I would say, okay, but I need an emotional motivation to do that. I need to be unhappy having not completed the task. You know, I need to be uncomfortable, right? If you're uncomfortable being out of shape, you'll get in shape. If you're happy being out of shape, then you're just going to stay out of shape, right? So if you feel a degree of uncomfortableness inside of your mind, I think it's just your mind telling you that something about your life needs to change. Yes. You need to get up and change something. Guys would say to me, I'm depressed because I'm fat and I have no girlfriend. And I'd say, no. You have no girlfriend and you're fat and that's why you're depressed. If you go change those two things, you'd probably be surprised that your disease goes away. I had another guy say he was gonna kill himself. I said, listen, it's back when I used to reply to my emails when I was smaller. I said, make me a promise, get a six pack first. A beer? <laughs> I said, get a six pack first, get in fantastic shape and then do whatever you want. Didn't want to kill himself once he was in fantastic shape. So he did it? Yeah. I have, I have the before and after, I'll put them on Twitter. Kind of interesting that, isn't it? So how are we going to say we have this disease, which is cause and effect? How are we going to have, we say we have this disease where there's something wrong with you as a man, you have a disease because your life sucks? I mean, I don't think that's true. I think that your life just sucks and you should change it. And another thing I also preach, and this is another thing that's very important, I also think as a man, because life as a man is pain and suffering, and when I say that, because you're never going to be a good man or good at being a man without pain and suffering. You're going to have to go through a bunch of, of shit and have a terrible life to become a good man. 
I think you should embrace that and accept it. And I think that the, the correct mental model for men to have is a degree of stoicism and not to be too concerned with even how they feel. If I woke up today happy, if I woke up today happy, I would have done this interview with you. If I woke up today sad, I would have done this interview with you. What's the difference? Why put so much importance on my emotion if certain things must be done? I must work, I must train, I must see Tucker Carlson, I must resist the matrix. He's got duties. I, I've got things to do. So, who, so why are we gonna sit around and talk about how I feel if it doesn't even affect how I act? And as a man, it shouldn't, because there's too much to do. And the, the masculine world is hyper competitive. This is another thing most people don't understand. Totally agree. It's hyper competitive out here. All the women want a few men at the top. The Ferrari, you, you don't want a Ferrari to drive fast. You want a Ferrari because other men want a Ferrari and can't have one. It's hyper competitive. So if you're competing against every other man for every dollar you make, every girl you see, the house you live in, the car you drive, the life you live, you're not going to be able to compete with the person who performs regardless of how they feel if you only compete when you feel like competing, right? Because there's men like me out there who will be sad every day and outcompete you regardless. I don't care how I feel. I will still win. And that's the kind of mindset you need to adopt. So I don't, when a man comes- You've got a job to do. Stop whining, go to work. Completely. Yeah, I agree. I'm Completely. Yes. So when men say, oh, but I don't, I feel sad. Who cares? The world doesn't care. All the men who are out here to destroy you and take your girl don't care. So why, are you, why do you care? Like the only, the person who should care least is you. You're the only person who wakes up every day who should have a genuine vested interest in improving your life. Nobody else wakes up and wants to improve your life, only you. So if nobody else cares about how you feel, why do you care? So I, my argument also for depression is, you're depressed, fine. Have you trained today? <laughs> well, that doesn't change what you should do with your life, depressed or not. And I don't say this because I'm an eternally happy person. I say this because I've experienced all ranges of human emotion. I was in a Romanian jail cell with cockroaches crawling all over me as I slept. I never missed a day of training. I wouldn't say I was particularly happy, but push-ups must be done. So they got done. Did you, you're very close to your brother. Correct. And you were locked away for part of that with him. And this, did you have fun at all with him? Yes. I, I do think there's something inside of men, whereas if you're with your boys or you're with your group yes. of men, yes. there's something inside of us. Totally. And it allows you to make the absolute best of the worst situations. Maybe that's an evolution from war. You know, all the yes. men went to war and you saw all this pain and suffering and you saw heads, people decapitated and you're injured, but then you sit around the campfire and you're laughing. You're laughing. That's yeah. right. It's something inside of us. It's like a coping mechanism when you're around men. So when me and him were together, no matter how bad the scenario or no matter what they tried to do to us, part of us would just look at each other like, cigarette? <laughs> and you find joy in that. And yeah, there's definitely, and that's another thing I think a lot of men are lacking. A lot of men are missing is a masculine support network. I think buddies. Buddies. Yeah. You know, you, you talk to a guy and say, what was the highlight of your life? What was the best time of your life? And they'll say, ah, oh, college football. It's not about the football. It's about the team. Yeah. You know? And I think a lot of that's destroyed as well. Because also when you, it's interesting how everything interconnects. When you destroy honor and principle and the masculine essence inside of men, well, now as a man, it's very hard to have friends. I wouldn't want to have a, a male friend who had no principles, no honors, and, and, and didn't work hard and was always crying about being sad. What do I want to hang around with him for? He's a loser, right? So then your support network's destroyed. And I think that men have always needed that since the dawn of time, and I think that's gone, but... They don't have friends. Men, especially middle-aged men, have no friends. Absolutely, because they've been told that to give them all away and do as the wife says, and then she left him. No wonder he wants to kill himself, wouldn't you? No wonder he's depressed. It just sounds like the worst existence ever, and now we're living in a world now, especially, where everything is hyper-competitive, especially the sexual marketplace. Like, if you're a... 52 year old, overweight, average income, no fame dude, and you have to find a girl, it's gonna be pretty difficult to find a good one. It's gonna be very hard. So we're like, well, of course he's lonely. Then, and then his kids don't respect him, they're busy. Like, of course he's sad. Like, it's, it's actually heartbreaking to discuss. It is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. But then how do you prevent that happening? Well, then you need to be a man of honor and principle and make sure that you Keep your support networks and make sure that your woman does respect you. And a woman's going to respect you when she says, sees other men respect you. Yes. And, and they're only going to respect you if you respect yourself. But to respect yourself, you have to be the kind of person who says no. What do you think of porn? There's been some statistics. There's been some studies done. Most men or less men are having sex than ever before. I've seen that. Yeah. And what that's, is that? Well, that's an extension of the fact that masculine virtue is being destroyed. That's the thing that's interesting about all these things. They psyop, especially men, they say, listen... Women want a feminist man. 
Women want a man with no moral principle who would make sure that there's a conversation about who should fight the burglar when your house is broken into because equal opportunities, equal rights, of course. Don't, you know, don't presume just because you're a man that you should defend her physically. Of course not, that makes you a bigot and a misogynist. So they convince men to adopt these virtues and ways. And of course, women, by and large, dislike them for it. So now as men's, as masculinity is plummeted, a whole bunch of men are simply not having sex anymore. And then they become addicted to porn, which is cucking, effectively. I mean, two people are having sex and you're just watching it. <laughs> and, it's, and it's become a, yeah. Good point. I mean, and it's become a pandemic, right? So men are replacing genuine sexual relationships with just the computer screen and porn. And it's becoming a very, very big problem. And that's also exasperated by the fact that I think the sexual marketplace has become globalized. This is the thing I say to young men. A lot of men come to me with problems and my only answer to them is masculine excellence. I say that in the world we live in today, being a normal man or below normal is gonna be terrible. You have to be an exceptional man because the sexual marketplace especially, even if you just want to find a wife, is globalized. If you, in 1955, if you met the hot girl in the Nebraskan town, she was the hot girl in the Nebraskan town. If you meet her today, she's being offered to go to Courcheval and go skiing in France, and she's right. being offered to fly to Dubai, and there's millionaires who can just fly her anywhere and give her anything she wants, and, and who are you? Right, it's, it's getting harder and harder as a man to even find the most basic human function of re reproduction. Even to just find a woman you can reproduce with, it's becoming more and more difficult. You also couple that with the fact that they've destroyed morality in women also. So when you destroy the morality in men and you destroy how a man should act and then you destroy how a woman should act, it's, they're go you're both going in the opposite direction. Most women out there are very happy to share a man who's just rich and famous and they don't, they don't care. It's right? So, so, so if you're the normal guy, you know, there's, there's this rich famous guy with 30 girls, that's 29 dudes who are lonely and they end up watching porn. And if you have a porn addiction or you have a problem with porn, you have a problem with yourself because I guarantee if you're the kind of man you're supposed to be, you would have no time for that and you wouldn't need it. I can confirm that's absolutely not really the case. Yeah. 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 So the fact you even need porn shows there's a problem with you as a man, because if you were the kind of man you could be, and I genuinely believe that any man can become anything, then you'd have unlimited sexual options and you would have no interest in that. And and I do want to make this clear to the world because there's a bit of a misconception about my story. My father was in the military and then he left to become a professional chess player. He was a traveling chess player. You don't make money with that. My mother and father broke up at age nine. We moved to England purely because you get more help from the state. I was raised on welfare in Marsh Farm, which is the worst area of the worst town, Luton, with the highest crime rate. I went to a school with a 4% pass rate, single mother household effectively. Started from absolutely nothing became a kickboxing world champion. Your mother was English? English, correct. So I, I started at the absolute lowest echelon of life and I would like to consider myself pretty somewhere near the top now. I've been through absolutely every stage. So when I say to men, you can become anything you want and my answer to you is masculine excellence, there's no other answer. I can't tell you how to rig the game and cheat the game. If we're all racing a race and I have a Ferrari and you have a Nissan, I mean, sure, you can get a bit better at driving, but you're probably gonna lose. You have to get a, a better character to play this game of life. So that's why I preach masculine excellence because for many of the world's problems today, porn, sexual access, being respected by your peers, making sure that your wife's gonna stay with you after the children are born for a very long time, that's right. being happy, anything, it all comes down to who you are as a man. A lot of the answer, the only answer is masculine excellence. There's nothing you can do besides hard work, accept the trauma and pain and suffering and, and work harder than everyone else around you worked. And, and that's why porn's a problem. So I will genuinely say to any man out there who finds himself loading up that website, go take a look in the mirror and realize why no one wants to fuck you. If you're- if, Fair. No, and, and I said this to guys before, if you were a girl with all the choices she has, would you choose you? Think about it. And if you're honest with yourself, a lot of these guys, if they look in the mirror and go, you know what? No, I wouldn't choose me. Work out why and do something about it. Absolutely not our self accountability. This is something that's also missing. I take accountability for everything in my life. Even going to jail, although it was unfair, although it's a matrix attack, although it's garbage, it was my fault. I sat there and go, what did I do wrong? How can I learn from this? Where, did, where is my part to play in this? What did I do? Because my actions are what I have the most control over. 
I have self-accountability for everything. If a woman doesn't want to sleep with me, I don't sit and say, ah, oh, women are this way, society's that way. I just sit and say, okay, why? What can I change? So any man who's loading up porn needs to go have a long conversation in the mirror and realize that he's not desirable or as desirable as he should be or could be. I come from absolutely nothing. I'm mixed race. My father was black and my mother's white. So statistically, mixed race, single household, single mother household, bad area. I, I ticked every box to end up in jail. I ended up in jail for the wrong reasons. But <laughs> I guess you fulfilled your destiny. Can't escape statistics. I ticked every box to be a delinquent and I refused to be one. I absolutely utterly refused to be a delinquent. I said, no, that's not who I want to be. I want to be a superhero. And I know the only way to be a superhero is to one, suffer, like Batman did, his parents died, and two, work hard. What does your mother think? My mother's exceptionally proud of me. She, she still worries because mothers worry. But even when we were in jail, she said, well, I know you're both strong, so. Like, she knows she has men. She knows she has, you know. That's pretty great. Yeah, of course. And, and I think that's what, I mean, I, I, I believe especially also, I think a man has a duty to his last name. I think we carry the last name. We have a duty to our last name. I am a Tate. I am my father's son. The reason my father so, is discussed so heavily is because of my monumental success. I keep him alive via my success. I would love to think my son does the same thing. Yes. They will talk about my son in a way where they're so interested in his life path that I must be discussed by extension and then I live forever. So I have a duty to Tate. I have a duty to my last name. I must perform. And this is what I said to my mother on the phone. I'm a Tate. It's fine. Oh, but the conditions are bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's life. And even as a man today, you're waking up, you want to load up a porn website. You should, you should have respect for your last name and you should sit and say, is this who I am? Is this what I do? I mean, I, a lot of this comes down to the things we discussed at the very beginning. Self-respect, self honor, dignity. Well, you have no dignity. Well, I have too much dignity for that shit. And a lot of these men have no dignity, no self-respect, and it's all an extension. It extends of why they're never going to be who they could be and also what they do to cope with that. And yeah, porn is a coping mechanism. What do you think of women? I think women are some of the most powerful people on the planet, firstly. A lot of the conversations we're having, most people don't understand that women are the gatekeepers and women are the ultimate judges. Women are the ultimate judges, especially in, of, of sexual access, right? So when I say that, Maybe 40% of the letters I got in jail were from women, just love letters. Perfume on them and kiss, kiss marks. And the traditional masculine role is still respected and loved by so many women. If you were to ask the average woman on the street who hasn't lost her mind what she wants in a man, she would like to be financially provided for, physically protected. I love women. I think they are the most powerful and precious things on the planet. They give life. But I believe that when you love a woman, you should want to protect her and provide for her and take care of her. I don't believe you love a woman by wanting to do everything she says and cucking to her. I don't believe that because I love women, I should have no standards on what I expect in a woman. I don't think because, I don't think loving women is sitting there going, a woman can do whatever she wants to me and I put up with it. I don't think that's loving women at all. I think loving women is saying, I'm going to be the best man I can be. And the only way I'm going to be a good man is with a degree of standard. And I'm going to be the best man I can be for you. And when I say these things, I get attacked for being a misogynist because- Well, well how is that? I think misogynist means someone who hates women. Correct, because I have conversations with women who are, let's say I've done some podcasts with women who are very promiscuous. And I've explained to them that since the dawn of human time in every single society across the planet, prom promiscuity in females has been frowned upon. Yes, that's true. It hasn't been frowned upon in men, but it has been in women. I explained- In a big way. In a big way. In many, in many parts of the world to this day, you can't get married if you're not a virgin. I'm not saying all women should be virgins. I was explaining to her that female promiscuity has always been hated. In every holy book, it's disliked. You've bought into this new think for the last 10 years and you seem to think it's empowering. And I would argue that it's not empowering. And I sat there and had a conversation with this promiscuous woman and I said to her that she is doing herself a disservice and she's dishonoring herself and she's never gonna be happy or fulfilled jumping from bed to bed. And I was told that this makes me misogynistic because women are empowered and they can make whatever choices they want and I'm insecure to believe that a woman who slept with 300 men is somehow changed mentally and her ability to bond and love a man has been affected by that. But, that, but it is, that's true. Well, unfortunately, you're gonna end up in a Romanian jail cell for being a misogynist. <laughs> no, I mean, I, lo I love women. Um, and so I, 
And I've seen it, and I, that is true what you said. The thing, that's, the thing that's interesting is that women intrinsically understand this. Yes. Because if you see a woman dislike another woman, what's the first name she calls her? Slut. It's the first thing, it's the first thing a girl says to a girl she doesn't like. It's the biggest insult that comes to her mind yes. is that she's promiscuous, right? So it's interesting, but I've been called a misogynist for that. And then I've made, I've been on the internet for a long time. I've made some jokes. I've made some videos and people don't understand satire or comedy. There's one that they keep repeating. I made a joke next to my bed. I had a Glock, like many people do. And then I had a knife next to my bed and there was a comedic skit where it said, the girl caught me cheating and she picked up the knife and I slapped it out of her hand and said, you still love me. And they, they cut the bit out where I talked about the girl attacking me with the knife. They just took the bit where I say, slap the knife out of her hand. You're the boss, da, da, da. And they, he's a misogynist, he's a misogynist. And they, it's just taken out of context. And that's another thing that's happened to me. And I am aware of this. And like I said, I take absolute self-accountability, but the way you make jokes and make videos when you get hundred views is very different than the way you would make a joke or make a video when you get millions of views. And when they're trying their best to find, they look at a four hour video and find three seconds. I'll give you an example of it where, where it hurt me very recently. I did a podcast where I was discussing corruption. I discussed what I, which country I believe is the most corrupt country in the world. They start a lot of wars. And uh, the answer to that by the person I was discussing it with is, well, you live in Romania, Romania is corrupt. I said, Romania is corrupt, correct. But I don't think they, there's certainly corruption, but they, they don't start monumental wars which end up in millions of deaths. I would argue that their corruption because a police st man stops me and I can bribe my way out of a parking ticket or a speeding ticket is far less destructive. So we discussed this at length for hours. They cut out the bit where I said Romania is corrupt and showed it to the judge that kept me in jail. Ooh. Yeah. So, and that's, that's my problem in a nutshell. Long format co content, people will find a little bit, edit it up and try and attack me with it. And that's where this whole misogynistic things come from. It's either from me arguing with promiscuous women on podcasts designed for promiscuous women to argue their point and I destroy them so flawlessly that I'm a bad person or something taken out of context. And it's insane because like I said, the amount, the amount of support I get from women is actually monumental. The amount of mothers who write to me and say that their son's doing better than ever. The amount of women who write to me and say that their boyfriend's doing better than ever. The amount of women who love me and just want to meet me. This idea that I'm hated by women is probably the biggest lie about this whole story. I, I don't want to brag, but I can assure the world that's absolutely not, really not true. I had thousands of letters of support from women. In fact, there was one girl never met her, she would play love songs from her car outside the jail. So she put the music on and play love songs. And uh, I managed to tweet out via my cousin the, the songs I wanted to listen to. White Snake, Is This Love? And she, <laughs> White Snake? <laughs> and she'd play them for me. Never met her. Don't know who she is. So you're in a Romanian prison cell requesting White Snake on the radio in the car outside. Correct. And some girl would pull up and, and put it's kind her, of a surreal moment. Put her speakers on full and play me my love songs for a good like three or four minutes before the police would come and make her move. I got a song a day. But yeah, this idea that I'm universally hated by women is insanity. That's not, that's not true. So you said you're a mixed race. Your dad was black, your mom was not, was white English. What do you make of the race conversation in the United States? I think it's deliberately, they're trying to put fuel on the fire and they're deliberately trying to accelerate division. This is what I believe. I think that if a black billionaire and a white billionaire meet somewhere, I don't think there's much conversation about race. I don't think- <laughs> No! <laughs> No. I don't think there's any racism. No. Interesting. No? They're not that interested in the topic, actually. They don't care. Right. Right? But amongst the lower echelons of the populace, they seem very interested in trying to turn us all on each other. Yes. I wonder why that is. And I wonder why they deliberately make laws and push media matters which are designed to do exactly that. I wonder why that is. We can sit and I have my own theories. But um, I think what certain people in the world would be most afraid of is the white people of a certain economic class and the black people of a certain economic class shaking hands and saying, yeah. this is bullshit. <laughs> I think that would be very yes. intimidating for them. So it's certainly accelerated. And it's also very interesting because as a mixed race person, I will also sit and state 
I don't look particularly black. Most people can't guess where I'm from. I've had more discrimination against me for being a straight male than I've ever had for my skin color. I've had more people look at me or have problems with me purely because of my sexual orientation and my general, generally masculine essence than I've ever had anybody say anything about my skin color ever. And I'll also say, if somebody has a real problem with my skin color, who cares? If someone's that ignorant, who gives a shit? Like, I, it's also, I, I do find it amazing they manage to psyop people into being so brutally offended by it. If someone were to come up to me and say, you're not white, I'd say, correct. Have a nice day. <laughs> who cares? Like, like I, it's, it's amazing how they, they've got everyone wrapped up in this. But yeah, it's certainly accelerated. And another thing that's very interesting about it, especially in America, a lot of Americans are insulated to, I feel like, world history. Yeah, I've noticed. You know, they're like, oh, slavery, slavery, slavery. Slavery was everywhere. Every country had slaves. The Arabs had slaves. The Chinese had slaves. Yes. Aztecs had slaves. Everybody had slaves. The American Indians had slaves. Everybody did. A lot of slaves. Correct. And they're like, oh, we've been enslaved. Everyone was enslaved. Unfortunately, the world wasn't such a nice place, right? And there's been ethnic divisions in every single country on earth since the dawn of time. There still is in many countries in the world today. They, they believe this is a uniquely American issue. And I would strongly argue that one, it's completely and utterly not. And two, I think that if you are black, white, Asian, I think if you stand up, self-respect, work hard, try your best, turn up on time, firm handshake, don't make excuses for anything, don't look for an easy way out, no matter what your skin color is, in America or England or any other Western nation, I think you can be extremely successful. I don't think anything's stopping you. That's not the message you get from, say, Kamala Harris, who's also mixed race. Her dad was Jamaican, her mom is Indian. Yeah. Um, but race is really at the center of her identity and her politics. What do you make of, say, Kamala Harris? Well, let's, let's look at why they purport the idea that depression is so powerful and that you can just catch it from the sky and now you're permanently depressed no matter what happens to you and there's nothing you can do about it and you can't improve your life and you can't be a better person, right? It's that self-limiting belief. I think by also pushing this racism argument, it's also very much the same thing. I think if you adopt that mindset, if you wake up and you're a particular color, you're purple, and you believe purple people can't make it, what's your chance of making it? Zero, Yeah. right? So that's what's so destructive about it. This is what I'll even argue when I argue this point with people and they try and say, oh, but this happens and they pull out these statistics and all this garbage from the matrix. I say, listen, even if, even if the world's racist against purple people, the best thing you can do is be such an exceptional purple person that they need you in the, t they need you. The, the only answer is hard work. The only answer is self-accountability, masculine essence, honor, dignity, making your ancestors proud of you because you hold the same last name as them. The answer is the same regardless anyway. But when people like Kamala or Kamala are pushing this racism agenda, they're trying to say to people effectively, you'll never be anything. And you don't stand a chance of ever being anything. And I think that that makes people who aren't anything feel a little bit better about themselves. It's cope. And that's the only fans she has left are losers who she's told it's okay to be a loser because there's no way you could have not been a loser. And I will argue you could have been something a lot more than that. And you shouldn't listen to anybody who tells you're not gonna be a loser. If someone were to come to me and say, Andrew, you're a mixed race, you're from a single mother household, you're never gonna be rich. I'll say, watch me. I don't believe you. I don't believe you, who are you? So everything she's saying is one, wrong. Two, it's destructive to believe in. Three, I think it's her last hope at having any kind of fan at all because she's largely incompetent. I don't think I've ever heard her put a compendious, coherent sentence together. Um, and perhaps also, maybe that's the reason why she leans so heavily on race because she's not impressive or competent. So she can say, oh, but I'm this color and I did it. Instead of actually talking about how good of a job she's doing. Because if you have to discuss that part of her career or that part of her current life path, I think she'd be in a lot of trouble. I wanna show you video of Joe Biden's challenger for the Democratic primary, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. What do you think of him? 
I think a strong body is a strong mind. I don't think there's anything wrong with a man exercising all until, uh, up until the age he dies. Why wouldn't he? I think that the bottom line of masculinity since the dawn of human time has been a propensity and a capability for violence. I think that's what makes a man a man. I don't see any possible negative connotation with being in good physical shape. I yeah. think that's a fantastic way to show discipline, which is very important in any man who's important, especially a world leader. In fact, I love the idea of uh, an elected world leader being in fantastic physical shape. I think it shows that they're a motivated, disciplined person, and I have a lot of respect for him for that. And I think that in, in the military, we make it mandatory, right? To be in fantastic physical condition. Yes. To, to, so why wouldn't we have it mandatory for people who are in charge of the entire world? I think it's fantastic. The President of the United States seems to be failing physically. What, as you look back at the country whose passport you hold at the president, like what, what's your reaction? Well, sometimes, and it's not very often I consider myself ignorant, but I feel like there must be some magic I missed because wasn't he the most voted for president in history? Oh yeah, billions of votes. Yeah, it must. There must be some magic I just can't detect, Tucker. I don't want to. More than Barack Obama, 81 million votes. It's insane. And I mean, Barack, yeah, sure. He was very intelligent, articulate. Yep. He was concise and compendious with his ideas. He yes. could make you understand how he thinks. Yes. But Joe must be better in some way. I just, I can't seem to see, see how, and I guess the fault is with me. I uh, don't know what to say about that one. It's one of those lies that's so ridiculous that you're just like, uh, I don't, okay. <laughs> he got more votes than Barack Obama. Shut up, he did. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I want to get your take. This is sort of small ball, but it, it, I think, tells you something about a larger trend in the United States. This is a state senator from the state of Wisconsin in a public hearing recently saying, in a discussion on a crime bill, fuck the suburbs. Here she is. Fuck the suburbs. Because they don't know a goddamn thing about how life is in the city. What is that? There's a hostility there. Where does that come from? That comes from being a perpetual victim. That comes from being told that everything that's happening to her is not her fault and she has no self-accountability. Even though she's managed to become a senator, somehow right. she's still oppressed. And that means that everyone else who looks like her is also completely and utterly oppressed. And anybody who has a slightly better life in any way is by extension a bad person because they weren't oppressed. Yes. And that's where the hate comes from. The divisions put there by these mindsets which are being purported by the people in charge of the world, convincing you that you have no control at all over your own life. And that's why she's so resentful towards people who have done well in life, not even as well as her. Right. I would also argue, perhaps I'm incorrect, that she probably lives in a suburb. <laughs> of course she does. So she's a hypocrite on top of that. Yeah. But hypocrites are, the fantastic thing about being a hypocrite is if you're a hypocrite with a little bit of power or influence, you're allowed to be a hypocrite because you're, you're spreading information on the larger problem. In fact, this is actually interesting. One of my funnest things, I might, I'm gonna announce this here on your show for everyone to know, this is a world exclusive. I wanna become a climate change activist because when I was younger, people would say, what do you wanna be when you grow up? Do you wanna be a fireman? Do you wanna be Batman, etc." And I wasn't sure what would really make me happy, but now I'm ultra wealthy and I fly around on private jets all the time. I think that now is the time for me to become one of those hypocritical climate change activists. 100%. It's going to be super fun. Well, as your carbon footprint grows, your concern about carbon footprints grows. Absolutely. <laughs> eat the bugs. Sell your car. How dare you eat meat? On my jet, of course, I have meat, but I'm allowed to be a hypocrite because I'm spreading awareness for the overall problem. It's for the so, greater good. It's for the greater good. I have to get to the climate change activist meetings. So, uh, Which happened to be in Switzerland, I noticed. Of course. So... <laughs> Although I'm flying on, well, before this arrest. They're never in New Jersey. Never. So before this arrest, I was on about three or four jets a week. But um, every single time I was flying on my private plane, I was extremely concerned about the carbon footprint. Of course you were. And so I am now a climate change activist. I just want to let the whole world know. Because once you get to a certain level of power of influence, you're absolutely not allowed to be a complete hypocrite. So you're allowed to live in the suburb and then tell everyone, fuck the suburbs. And uh, pretend that you're oppressed when you're a senator of the most powerful nation on the planet. Because it's just, it's a logic fail on every plant, on every level. So one of the human activities has got to produce the greatest carbon footprint is, I would think, war, right? I would think so. Diesel-powered machines, munitions going off, 
So I was a little bit surprised to see Greta Thunberg with Zelensky this morning. It's, what's interesting to me is this. Firstly, I would never kill myself. Secondly, <laughs> imagine these people are so detached from reality. Imagine going, you know what we need to do? Brainwave. We need to drum up support for this garbage. Let's take our, let's take the, the most loved woman, Greta, and the most loved man, Zelensky, and let's make them meet. Think about the PR, let's bring a camera. And imagine people sitting around a table going, that's great, that's, that's gonna really make people support this. <laughs> Who gives a fuck? I don't wanna swear, I'm sorry, but some young girl turns up to a war zone who has nothing. Why is she there? What are they going to talk about? I don't know. But what's their conversation? I think she only yells. I don't think she does talk. I, I don't understand. Is she going to talk about how the childhood has been stolen from all those million Ukrainian men who have been born to, blown to pieces? Like she talks about childhood being stolen because we drive, you know, cars? <laughs> I don't think she is. I don't think she's going to mention that. No. Is it just a big PR opportunity? Like what PR team came up with this concoction and thought this will keep them on side? It's, it's mind-bending to me who even thought this was a good idea. It, it's crazy. But, but of course somebody did. Somebody thought it was a fantastic idea. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever met Greta Thunberg? No, but me, me and her have had some ar internet arguments. I, I think you went to prison for it, right? Yeah, correct. Which is amazing because I'm a climate change activist. So I'm on her team. You know, I was in Sweden during COVID. So we could have met. She didn't want to hang out with me, unfortunately. And then... Now I'm flying around on my jet everywhere, spreading news about climate change. Same thing, like in my Bugatti, obviously it's got a big engine. I, I make sure to talk about climate change out the window as I drive. But I'm on her side. She doesn't seem to be very You very yell at the surfs as you pass about climate change? Yeah, don't eat meat, eat the bugs. What's wrong with you people? You don't care about the earth? Like if, if, you, don't, if you don't start caring about climate change, all those politicians with beachfront property are gonna lose their houses. Yes. And they're very concerned about climate change, which is why they bought their houses on the beachfront so they can be the first to let you know it's coming. The early warning system, right? They're very concerned. That's why they want to be right there on the beach. Quite honorable if you think about it. Kind of, kind of on the front lines of the climate crisis. Absolutely. Lead from the front. <laughs> so good. Um, but one more point about this. Sorry, sorry to go on and on. No, I love it. But when I say these things, people, you don't care about the environment. And I try and explain to them, I love nature. You love hunting, fishing, you love yes. nature. I love nature. Passionately. The problem with all of these things is not that I don't like nature. The problem is that nearly any issue which appears to be virtuous on the planet today is Trojan horsed with garbage. That's the problem. Yeah. I have no problem with fixing or maintaining or preserving nature. I have a problem with them telling me I have to maintain nature. Them Trojan horsing my bankruptcy into the middle of it knowing that nature won't be fixed, then telling me it's about nature and telling me I should agree with it. That's my problem. There's, no, there's nothing left on the planet, no issue, which isn't Trojan horsed with absolute garbage. Yes. And if you're gonna sit there and tell me that I need to give more money to the government to stop the sun from being hot, I'm gonna argue with you that I'd rather keep my money. Thank you very much. Yes. So, this is the problem with all these issues. It's nearly anything. When I argue against some people, like, you don't care about the issue. I do, but you're not smart enough to understand that the legislation around this issue is so large, it hasn't even been read by most of the people voting for it. Yeah. And there's something in the middle of it which is gonna damage every single person's life which has nothing at all to do with the issue itself. And most people don't understand that. They co-opt people's best instincts. Their love of nature, which is a virtue, of course. Yep. Their love of their neighbors during COVID. Don't you care about your neighbors? Oh, well, completely. Of course you do. And your grandparents, I revere my grandparents. Of course, of course. And, okay. you're a and you're a bad person if you resist. I was a terrible person for going to Sweden. You're a very bad person. You don't care about anyone else. That and that's how they do. It's weaponized virtue. And the, the, my opposers, every single virtuous thing that comes out of their mouth is never from a place of virtue. It's from a place of hate. Yes. It's weaponized. And also, and I don't talk about this very often, but people can go right now to tatepledge.com. I donate $25 million a year to feeding children in war-torn countries, especially in the Islamic world, because that's where a lot of the war is. Nobody ever mentions that, ever. Nobody mentions any of the charitable work I do. Nobody mentions any of the lives I save. Nobody mentions any of the people who support me. They don't mention anything at all. They just come along and say, you're a bad person. And I say, well, if I'm a bad person, let's talk about the things you've done to genuinely benefit humanity, besides sit on Twitter and talk shit. Have you ever done anything for anybody ever? Are you capable 
of doing anything. Because the things that make me a bad person, right? You don't like me for my principles and the fact I stand up for myself and the fact I have parameters and I say no, everything you hate about me. Those are the things that allow me to even do good in the world. If I was like you, mush, goo, I couldn't even help anyone. If you had to help someone today, how could you even do it? You're broke and you're lazy and you're stupid. You can't even, you can't even enlighten anybody. You can just spread hate. How is that helping the world? These people are a net negative, genuinely. And that's what's so crazy about being attacked for your morality, like I'm being now. And when you're a good person in general, they attack your morality because the people who are attacking you are absolutely not immoral. The ultimate hypocritical, hypocriticism, ultimate. Even more than my private jet climate change stance. So it's, it's certainly unique. I do like to believe, though, we're entering a new stage of consciousness. I do like to believe, at least from 10 to 15 years ago, more people are, I think COVID woke some people up. I do like to believe the MSM credibility is tanking in real time. Trump helped massively. Fake news. Two words. Before Trump, when did you ever hear fake news? I didn't really hear it that often. No. Fake news, fake news, fake news. And he did a fantastic job of that, and he's starting to wake people up. So I'd like to believe there's a degree of us winning, but... I just want to make it very clear to the people who attack me and the people who attack anybody who stands up for what they believe in, a lot of their virtue, their virtue, their virtue signaling is just hate peddling. And when they can't call you unsuccessful and they can't call you stupid, they have to find a way to hurt you. And the only way they can do that is to say you're a bad person. I've noticed. I've sure. noticed. <laughs> yes, yes, I have. Um, so here's Joe Biden expressing his concern about how Putin is doing in the war in Iraq. Interesting. It's hard to tell, but he's, he's clearly losing the war in Iraq. He's losing the war at home. And he has uh, become a bit of a fly around the world. Do you think Putin is losing the war in Iraq? I don't think he's losing the war in Iraq. I don't think he's fighting a war in Iraq. Okay. Um, he also said he's losing the war at home. I don't think he's fighting in Russia. And I'm also not sure he's losing. So it's a pretty interesting statement on many levels. It's scary. You know, it's a joke, but it's scary. Because... I would never kill myself, but I think the reason he was put into office is because he's incompetent. Yes. Because that makes him easy to control and influence. That's what's most scary. It's not scary that he's become incompetent in office. It's that they looked at him and goes, that's who we need. That guy. That's what's most scary to me. Does it surprise you that the weakest president is also the most destructive? Weak men are always destructive because hurt people hurt people. Yeah. If, I don't know. I heard... Someone said that to me a long time ago, hurt people hurt people. They were talking about a relationship and I said, that's true. If your heart's been broken, you're probably gonna be a bit of an asshole and break someone's heart, hurt people hurt people. And then I thought, well, if you're a weak man and you're going through life and you don't have the strength and resilience to resist the trials and tribulations of being a man and you're constantly hurt by everything and you're constantly upset and depressed and sad because you're weak, how could you possibly do good? Hurt people hurt people, right? To do good, you have to be a good person to begin with. And to be a good person, you're virtuous and you've gone through a lot of things that made you strong. I, this is what's mind bending to me, that the idea that strong men are somehow bad. And it's the ultimate hypocrisy because as soon as something happens, especially physically, as soon as a liberal is attacked, they call the police. Defund the police, call the police. <laughs> Don't be masculine, police officer, police. They want a big, strong man with a gun. Guns are bad. They want him to have one, right? So the ultimate hypocrisy on every level is absolutely and utterly insane. At the base realities of humanity, the absolute base reality, strength in men is respected and wanted. And I think that the closer you get to unfortunate circumstance, the closer you get to reality, they go hand in hand. And then everyone's looking for the strong men. So strong men should always lead, I believe. And for the longest period of human time, that's how society functioned, the strongest men led. But in the Western world now, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. And weak men are emotionally led. They're not particularly stoic. They're impulsive. And I would say that the most heinous acts, perhaps, that happen in modern society today are purported and committed by weak men. I don't think a school shooter is a strong man. I think it's a weak man. I think it's a man who's been picked on, got butt hurt, is upset. Girls don't like him. Never learned any emotional control. He's the kind of person who does exactly what the TV tells him to do. Act out your feelings. Cry when you want to cry. Well, now he's angry. So now what? You told him to act out his feelings. What do you expect him to do? 
I think that weak men do the worst things. I think weak men hurt women. I think weak men rob stores because they don't want to wake up and work hard and go to work and, and do it the honorable way. It's a weak man who goes and steals. It's a weak man who beats the shit out of a girl. It's a weak man who, school, who shoots up a school. This is all weak men stuff. And society as a whole is telling men to be weaker and weaker, saying it's somehow the solution to everything because being a man is toxically masculine. Being a strong man is bad. It's toxically masculine. To be a good man, you have to be a very weak one. Well, look at the most heinous acts that are committed in society. Show me a strong, honorable, virtuous man of principle who's doing any of this stuff. So weak men commit the atrocities in this world. Absolutely they do. And it's weak men who also attack anybody of virtue. Because I think when you're weak, you're intrinsically unhappy. Yeah. I don't think as a man you can be happy if you're weak. I think happiness and strength go hand in hand. Yes. I think that's how we're supposed to be, right? Even strength of mind, strength of conviction, strength of something. If you're weak, you're going to be miserable. So I do find satisfaction in the fact that most of the men who truly dislike me are miserable and weak. And also, like I said earlier about women being gatekeepers, women are fantastic. Women are a fantastic, they're like a barometer for society. I would say you can measure the strength of a society or the virtue of a society or how decayed a society is largely by the actions of many women. I'd like to, to argue that point. I can argue that point in many different ways. But women really want their man to be strong. Of course. They will punish you for being weak. And I'm not saying you can never cry to your woman. I'm not saying you can never open up to your woman. But there's going to become a time where she expects you to just be capable. There's a problem. And even if you don't know how to fix it, your job as a man is to say, I'll handle it. Even if you have no money and no hope. And to go find a way to fix the problem. If you're weak and go, I don't know, I don't know. She becomes very resentful towards you. And she'll punish you for that that weakness. And I think what she's trying to do on an evolutionary standard is inspire you to man up because it's your job to protect her, isn't it? Of course. So if she sees you and looks at you and doesn't see you as a man who can protect her, she can't respect you. So every survey of female happiness in the West shows a, just an, a straight decline since about 1970 till now. Women are becoming less happy yeah. in the West. I think it's very obvious. What accounts for that? How can you be happy when all the men around you aren't men, right? We are the most beautiful union that God has possibly created on the planet, a, ma a feminine woman and a masculine man, it's the most beautiful union that can possibly exist. It raises children the best. It, both parties are happier. Both parties gain. It's a net positive for everybody. There's no negative. There's no downside. But if you destroy one side of the equation, then the other side is going to be completely and utterly miserable and unhappy. How as a woman can you be happy if you can't find a man who you believe can protect you, provide for you, sticks up for you, has morals, has principles? There's none of those men left. So then what they do is just go from man to man trying to find it. And by the time they've been through enough men to maybe find someone semi-close to it, they've been through too many men to ever be happy. And then you have the absolute destruction of Western society. We talk about why men don't get married anymore. I can tell you why I wouldn't want to get married in America. I don't see the point in being married to a woman who's had so many partners before me that she can't properly pair bond with me and then giving her the opportunity to financially destroy me. I think that would be a bad chess move. And I do believe in marriage. I think society would be better if everyone was married. I'm saying that if you're living in an immoral society, being a moral person, if you're not careful about it, you can get wrecked. If the game is rigged, you'd be very careful if you play it. So how do we encourage men to get married? Well, they need to be worth marrying, but so do the women, right? So everything's decaying on both sides. Everything's spiraling. One of the reasons I also got called misogynistic, and I'll say it here, I argue the point that for the longest period of human time, evolutionarily, women had to adopt and find a way to take the ethos of an opposing tribe perhaps quicker than a man could because of war. If, of the man, if the man would come and if the men would fight and a tribe lost and the women survived, they had to change how they thought to fit in with the new tribe to survive. Yeah, because they'd be carried off. Because they'd be carried off. Of course. Like the, the French women were sleeping with Nazis towards the end of it. Towards the end of Paris occupation, all the French women were sleeping with Nazis. When the Nazis got kicked out, the French women had all had their heads shaved because they got caught hanging around with German soldiers. The German soldiers killed their husband. Three years later, they need to eat. So the German soldiers have a wage. He's handsome. It's amazing how quickly they can adapt. And that's for their own survival. That's fantastic. But then if you extrapolate that out and you understand that to be true, then you also understand that women are more susceptible to programming to a degree. I got called misogynistic by saying that if you sit 100 men and 100 women down in front of propaganda, I believe that 
women are more likely to believe a lot of that. I think a lot of liberals are female. They're more emotional. And, they're, and it's easier to convince them of something if you use an emotionally led argument, right? So if by extension you now have women who are emotionally led, who are being convinced and their logic is failing because they're being tricked with an emotionally led argument, and the man they're meeting has no principle and no honor and he can't resist that, she's in charge of the house, well now she's telling the man what to do, right? If I would have come home during COVID and my woman said, you need to wear a mask, I'd say, no I don't. End of conversation, but if I was a simp, you need to wear a mask, Okay, baby, Don't. all right. So the women are also a lot, largely in charge of the PSYOP because the men are so desperate to get any kind of connection with a real person and avoid the porn screen. And then these women are being controlled by the mass media as a whole. I say this to, uh, I have children, I don't talk about it often, but I say to the mothers of my children, I say, look, either we program their minds or society does. Who do you believe in? Everyone is being programmed by somebody, somebody and something. Me, you, everybody. We're all programmed by someone. To sit and think you're above programming is, is incorrect. What you have to do is sit and say, does the person who's programming genuinely have my best interests at heart? What do they want me to believe? Why do they want me to believe it? What happens if I believe what they want me to believe? Where does this lead? That's all we can do. We're all programmed. We're all the sum of the five people we spend the most time with. Right. Right? So if you have women with no father, no strong masculine influence, Who's programming them? The Kardashians and the news? The internet? Porn stars? What kind of woman's that gonna be? And then if a man finally ends up with her and he has no backbone, what kind of man's he gonna be? I don't wanna comment on these things because I don't want to make personal enemies of people I don't know. There's a guy called Adam22. Once again, I have no idea who this man is. I just saw on Twitter yesterday that he was with a porn star who'd never done a male scene they got married, and like a week after their marriage, she did her first male scene with some random dude. And he's on a podcast defending it. That his wife had sex with somebody else? Correct. Why? Like, this, this is the level you can, this, but this is what the Matrix wants from you as a man. They want the woman in charge and the man below with no backbone because if the woman's in charge, they can emotionally affect her. They can scare her. You can scare a woman easier than you can scare a man. A man. A real man's hard to scare. A woman you can make afraid of the vaccine, right? Be afraid, COVID, be scared. If she's in charge of the household, I would argue in nearly any household where the female was dominant, everyone's vaccinated. I would argue that point hard. Of course. Maybe I'm wrong, but I would argue it. I don't, I don't have the statistics. It's just logic to me. So <clears throat> talk about women being unhappy. What's actually interesting about the female mind, once again, they're going to call me a misogynist, is that when you're an emotionally led person, you're more prone to chaos. It takes real stoicism to lead. So why are these women unhappy? Because no one's leading them. No fathers, no men of no backbone, no man they respect. So they're relying on society, which is promoting chaos and their own mental state. Women will say all the time, oh, my period was coming up. So I was crazy. Like they'll say that themselves. So without any kind of hard rock of emotional security to give her a hug and say, don't worry, baby, calm down. It's okay. When, you're not, when you have no hard rock of emotional security and you lead her, leave her to her own devices, she's going to be to a degree chaotic. And you know who told me this? A woman said this to me. A woman said this to me. A woman said, most women are closer to a mental breakdown than you possibly believe, day by day. I was like, really? She goes, yeah, and that's, that's what I love about my husband. He makes me feel happy and secure and safe. If I'm starting to have a problem, I know I go to him and he makes me feel safe. He's my rock. There's a woman said this to me a long time ago. Yes. So why are women miserable? Because where are they going to get their happiness from? Where are they going to get their emotional stability from? It's not their job. I don't believe it's a woman's job to be emotionally stable. It's a woman's job to do many other very important things that men can't do. More important. They're better than men at a lot of things, women are. But it's our job to be emotionally stable. Women are better than us at certain things. We're better at other things. And that's why as a team, we're so powerful. To sit and pretend we're all the same the whole way through, then why do we even need each other anymore? Well, I don't think we do. You're exactly it. And this is why we have birth rates declining, porn, Women who are running around sharing one man with no intention of having children. Marriage is gone. Like, where do we think this is going to end? And what's interesting about well, it... Well, it ends with the training thing, right? Well, complete. Well, yeah. That's the ultimate. No, no, no I'm, I'm, I'm serious, though. Is it, I mean, if there's no... I mean, scrambling the idea of uh, the gender binary, of sex differences, like, that, that is kind of the end point, isn't it? Well, the end point is, yeah, men are the same as women, so it doesn't even matter. Right. I could be a woman today, could be a man tomorrow. None of it matters anymore. 
I also think a large part of this transsexual movement, I think a large part of it is a deliberate attack on us and our senses because they're trying to convince us to ignore our eyes. I do believe that is a bottom line. I think the bottom line of slavery are, are your own senses. Like no matter what I'm told that it's cold outside, I feel warm. That is my, that's the bottom line. So once they can convince you that your senses are wrong, well then you're completely open for the slave program. True. Once you can look at something with your eyes and ignore your eyes, you're a prime candidate. So I think a lot of this has also something to do with that. You are gonna say that's a girl. That's what you are going to say because you have to. And if you say it long enough, you'll think it. And if you won't, your children will because we'll tell them. And so eventually you're gonna say it and then it becomes true. Then you ignore your eyes. Now you believe anything, right? To the next thing comes along. Now you'll believe all the people on the jets telling you about climate change. It's all an attack on the senses. This is America's most famous admiral. You know, it, it's, it's so, it's such an important issue for our youth and adults. As you said, some of these laws are actually extending in, into adulthood. You know, we often say that gender affirming care is health care. Gender affirming care is mental health care, and gender affirming care is literally suicide prevention care. Would that be your view as well? I 100% agree. It's so, it's genuinely, I want to actually genuinely give my heartfelt condolences to any young person who falls for this crap, because you're going to be so miserable for the rest of your life. If you chop off your genitals, take a whole bunch of chemicals as a teenager, you are going to be miserable for the rest of your life. Yes. You're never going to be the person you want to be. You're never going to be accepted as that person. You're never going to feel happy inside. If you fall for this, I genuinely feel sorry for you. Me too. That's the first thing I'm going to say. The second thing I'm going to say, I find it very interesting that the only surgery we call affirming is gender surgery. Imagine a girl woke up and said, I was born in the wrong body because my tits are small. I'm a big titted woman, but I was born in the wrong body. I need, gen I need a tit affirming care. I need to affirm my true body shape. But otherwise I have a mental health problem. No, it's, 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 it's plastic. It looks good, perhaps, whatever. But we would never say she was born in the wrong body and we had to affirm her genuine body experience. Her triple Ds. Yeah, yeah, her triple Ds had to be affirmed. It's garbage. You're, you're not affirming anything. And also I think it's kind of interesting they say that trans people commit suicide at a higher rate. That's sad, nobody should kill themselves. I, I would hate for anybody to kill themselves. They say that's because they're picked on for being trans. I don't know why anyone's ever had the argument that perhaps they have a mental instability before this trans stuff and that's why they're more prone to, to suicide in the first place. Seems like an obvious explanation. Seems like an obvious explanation. I don't think it's normal for anybody to want to mutilate themselves. I, I think if someone were to come to me and say, I really want to cut my hand off, I would think they had a mental illness. Why? Don't like it. What do you mean you don't like it? I don't like my hand. I don't want it. I would think that's very concerning. So I really truly feel sorry for any young people who fall for this. I don't blame them. I think it's a massive psyop. And I think if you fall for it, you're going to be miserable forever. And I, one more point I'll make on this whole thing I found very interesting. I'm a professional fighter, so I spent a lot of time in Thailand when I was fighting. Kickboxing's big over there. And I've always thought, no one's ever mentioned that Thailand has a bunch of ladyboys, right? But if you say to a ladyboy, are you a man or a woman? She goes, I'm a ladyboy. What's that? I'm a man, but I'm a ladyboy. They don't see themselves as women in the real sense of I am female. Right. They don't want to compete against women in sports. They don't want to pretend they can have kids. They don't talk about having periods. They're like, oh, I'm a ladyboy. It's like kind of like an in-between, it's got yes. its own thing. India has the same. Yeah, it's fine. Nobody over there is genuinely arguing that they are actually female. Only in America are we doing that. And that's what's the craziest thing of all. Even if you truly, truly believe you need to change gender and you truly believe it's the right path for you and you believe you're not being psyoped and you believe you're going to be happy and you believe you need to mutilate yourself, that's all fine. But then to come along with the hubris and arrogance to tell me that I have to pretend you're something you're not, yes. biologically. That's right. That's absolutely not really arrogant. You can't tell me what I have to call you, right? I'm allowed to come to my own conclusions and opinions. And the whole point of being a human is that we've gone through life long enough to identify patterns. Imagine humans didn't identify patterns. One person went and got ate by the lion. You watch it happen. Then you go for a turn. 
Like, no, you work out over time. Don't go near the lion, right? If I look at a person who's six foot four, muscularly built, right, with a big jaw and a beard, my brain and my life experience tells me that's quite often a man. That's very often it is. Very yeah. often. That's the conclusion I've come to. To come along and say no, because I've decided to do X, Y, Z, you have to ignore all of the patterns you've identified throughout your entire life and everything you believe to be true. You have to throw away all the science and your entire worldview and everything about how you view the world. You have to eject that from your brain and call me what I want to be called is extremely arrogant. And if I went through the world and said everyone had to call me King Andrew, they'd tell me, shut up. Why? If they can get called whatever they want, I should be able to get called whatever I want. I want to be King Andrew, number one savior of earth, climate change activist. That's what I want to be. And if anybody calls me anything else, they're a bigot. That's what we're going to do. If we're going to go down that path, I'm going to make sure that my title is good. Lord of all lands, of, Lord of all beasts of the land and fishes in the sea. The most honorable man who's ever lived. The fastest human alive. Who cares? It doesn't matter that I can't run fastest. It doesn't matter, Tucker. I'm the fastest human alive. You must affirm my belief. I'm the fastest man alive. Greatest man in show business. Sorry, Tucker. <laughs> Best political commentator there's ever been. Let's just go down this path of insanity. Why not? We'll walk around with stickers on our head. It'd be great. It'd be fun. The scariest thing about all this stuff is that the world is still polarized to a degree because there's certain places in the world which are too close to baseline reality for survival, for any of this garbage to fly. You think you can go to Tajikistan where people are trying to eat and talk to them about gender and all this garbage? They'll be like, listen, you're a man, this needs doing, shut up, right? There's no time for any of that. So as the Western world is self-destructing self in real time, there are places in the world where none of this crap is happening. So who's gonna own the world in 100, 200 years? Like, it's still competitive to a degree, it's still bipolar, it's, there's, there's two sides to the world. I think that when men are men and women are women and we stop arguing about dumb shit, that society overall is more competitive. I don't know how America is going to maintain its influence over the entire planet when it's doing all this garbage. How long can this possibly last? Not long. Not long. It's like the fall of Rome. The fall of Rome, everything became decadent. Endless sex and orgies. No one had enough faith in the state to join the army anymore. And people talk about barbarians destroying Rome. Rome was destroyed from the inside. That's what happens. And we're, we're witnessing it in real time. And we have all these problems on Earth, and then they want to spend millions and millions of dollars on an investigation to prove that I'm a human trafficker for TikTok. It's clown world. It's nothing, nothing even makes sense anymore. This is a video from a recent Pride March in New York, and I'm interested in your view of it. <clears throat> So I have a few points on this. The first point is that it is an unfortunate reality, and I'm not gonna be called a bigot, I'm gonna talk about the reality that the homosexual community cannot reproduce in and of themselves. So for them to have a community into the future, they do need your, your children. That's how they think. For there to be a homosexual community in 100 years from now, they need straight people's kids. Because only straight people have children. So they're very, they're telling the truth. That's the first thing, they, they mean what they say. The second thing is, I think a lot of this is an attention grab by them. I think they are slightly disappointed in how tolerant many people actually are. I have no problem with gay people, I don't care. I'm gay, cool. I wanna get married, fine. I'm gonna wave my dick in your kid's face. Wait a second. <laughs> yeah. They, they push it to a point where we have to react. And then when we react, they say we're bigoted. Children are innocent, and destruction of innocence is one of the most disgusting things on the face of the planet. It's terrible if a child is killed in a war. It's terrible if a child's mind is warped by any propaganda mechanism. They're, they're innocent. What I don't understand is why, imagine heterosexual men walked around naked saying we're coming for the children. Well, someone gets shot. Absolutely. So why is it when for you For a good reason. Completely. So as soon as there's this sexual orientation, they're completely protected. And I think that the whole point of having children as a whole is to instill them with your worldview. I know if I have children, I want them to be like me. We just talked about my last name and how I want them to honor me into my into, post-death. Then I want them to be a representation of me. 
which means they should believe in my values and my creeds. Why is a group of people in New York walking around telling me what they're going to teach my kids and what my kids should believe? They're not your kids. They're my kids. Right. And that's what's so scary because children are impressionable and children are raised by the state and the internet effectively, which is why they want me off the internet. They want, but they'll let a lot of people stay on the internet that say a lot about a lot of things. I'll argue that if I was transgender, the American embassy would have told Romania they were bigoted and removed me pretty quickly. I would genuinely argue that point. They would say, no, what you're doing is, is abusive to the LGBT community. He must be removed from jail. Of course, immediately. Immediately. But because I'm straight and heterosexual, it doesn't matter. We're the, we're the class that suffers the biggest, the biggest bigotry that possibly exists in, in, in the Western world today. I would actually argue that point. But they're saying this to be deliberately provocative. They're deliberately trying to upset people. They want to upset you so that when you talk against it, you, they can call you names and call you a bigot. And also they mean what they say. And it's, it's truly scary. I'm obviously a Muslim, I'm Islamic. What most people don't understand about a lot of the Islamic world is that a lot of these things are outlawed, right? But people say, ah, so gay people can't go there. If you go to Dubai, you will see gay people. You can t if a guy wants to be gay and do whatever he wants to do with a full grown man in his own house, I don't care. And you can tell, you might have a waiter who's gay, whatever, etc. The only reason it's outlawed is not to stop a man, full grown man meeting a full grown man and doing what he decides to do. It's outlawed to prevent it bleeding into society and affecting the culture where the children are affected. That's why it's outlawed. And I'm not saying it should be outlawed in America, but what I'm saying is if you're not gonna protect the innocence of children from any ideology, and if the ideology is deliberately targeting children because children are more impressionable and more capable of believing in things which simply aren't true, perhaps a man, a man looking like a woman or vice versa, then that is a dangerous ideology that should be very closely examined. Well, if you're not going to protect children or if you're going to encourage women to fight your wars, why have a society in the first place? Well, this is another Isn't thing. the whole point of society to protect women and You children? know what's really interesting? I argued this point once. They were talking about how the West is a patriarchy and it's so terrible to be a woman in the West. And I'm like, well, where's better to be a woman then? If it's not the West, please tell me. Pick another country besides America where you'd rather be a woman. It's garbage to begin with, but she's saying, oh, America's a patriarchy and Americans are all misogynistic. And men are so bad and women have been oppressed since the beginning of time. It's always been a patriarchy. If that's true, why don't women fight our wars? Think about it. We can get the women of our country and the women of another country and let them go die in a ditch. And us men can just sit around being patriarchs. Why do we have to go die? Why do we have to go get our legs blown off? No, because we're a patriarchy. Women can go suffer. Or do the women get to stay at home and we go suffer? How is it a patriarchy, right? So that's garbage to begin with. But I think genuinely to go back to that point, any ideology which is waking up and saying, our worldview is so extreme, the only way we can truly ensure it exists into the future is to find the most susceptible people on the planet to program and attack their minds, children. I think that that's a destructive ideology and should be very closely looked at. And it doesn't matter if it's LGBTQ or anything else. I think if you sit children down and, and, and pump propaganda into their brain and that's the only way you can get what you want, then there's probably something wrong with your ideas because you're afraid to challenge them with a, a grown adult. You don't want a fair fight. You understand? They don't want a fair fight. They want to sit with a child who has no idea what he's talking about and tell him that men are women and women are men and vice versa and just completely confuse the poor child because they don't want a fair fight against a rational adult. And that's it, scary. It doesn't seem a huge improvement over, say, ISIS to me. Absolutely. That's how, how do you convince somebody to blow themselves up? Well, you find a young man, teenage boy, and you program his mind. Exactly. And it's exactly the same thing. They don't try and convince an older man to blow himself up because he's going to sit there and go, well, why don't you blow yourself up? And then there's an argument. You go out and find a young, susceptible person, right? And that's what's so scary about all of it. And, and it's also kind of funny that like this whole LGBTQ thing is also linked to the patriarchy, also linked to all this other garbage and all these other false narratives and false ideas. And it's these people who are attacking me saying, I'm dangerous for women because I'm a misogynist. You're dangerous for women for pretending men are women. You're more dangerous for women than I am. I'm saying a man's a man's a woman's a woman. You're saying that if I put a wig on, I could go punch women in the face in the boxing ring. Who's dangerous for women? It's insanity. <laughs> And again, they have no virtue at all. They just weaponize garbage and attack you with it. But I do think that children have to at least be the bottom line for society. That's the future. And if you have children at home, you're raising them. And if you struggle to feed them, the government doesn't care. 
They are yours and they're your problem and your responsibility and you deal with all of the stress and all the worry of them being out late at night and all the responsibility of taking care of them and you went through hell for them to exist. You don't owe their minds to anybody else. You don't owe it. So there has to be a point where you stand up and say, no, I raised this child. It's You're my not, child. That's my child. It's not yours. Absolutely. What do you make of Julian Assange? I think that it's crazy. It's the number one way to shut up the BBC, that's for sure. To mention him. Say, oh, you're a journalist. You care about journalism, do you? You care about a fair and independent story. Why is Assange in Belmarsh? Very interesting. What do they say? They don't answer. They try and change subject. They always do. I did it. I stole it from the Azerbaijani president he started. I saw that. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Do you know him? I, I don't know him, but I've seen, I've seen enough of his interviews to like him. Me too. Yeah, I like him. And this is what I'm saying about the world. There's so many places in the world where they still live very firmly in the real world. All of this garbage is just the result of the very simple, easy lives that we have. Inside the movie, The Matrix, which I recommend you watch, the agents say, we tried to create a utopia for the human mind so that your mind is in a utopian state and your body can just be used. But the human mind rejects utopia. We created the world in 1999 at the pinnacle of human civilization before machines took over because the human mind needs struggle and it needs problems, otherwise it rejects it. Yes. And I kind of feel like there's a whole bunch of people trying to just find problems and find struggle in their lives because they don't have enough motivation to do something that's genuinely difficult, like, you know, help people but they can't live in this state of complete vegetation. That's so right. then they wake up and say, oh, I'm oppressed, ah, my pronouns. How much energy must it take to go through life trying to correct every person you interact with to call you Z? I, think of the calories burnt. I can't think of a bigger waste of time. Think of the calories burnt. Every Starbucks employee, I was actually Z, correct. You are a moron and you are just wasting <laughs> so much energy. You could put that towards something beneficial. You could volunteer. You could, do, you could go to the gym. You could, there's so much more you could do with walk, instead of walking around and talking about Z, you sound like a dumbass. But they're just finding struggle because they don't have any actual important struggle in their lives. And that's why it only exists in the decadent West. Do you think the coming famine will change that? I, absolutely, I would argue that when the famine comes, I think all these feminists will look for a strong man of resource who is stoic, who has a good network, who's capable and important and respected. It's amazing how quickly feminism disappears. In fact, there's a podcast I did called Fresh and Fit. And I did this podcast in Miami and I was arguing about gender roles with seven girls. And during it, they were telling me that they can do anything a man can do, all the usual things. And they don't care, they don't need a man, all this garbage. And some crazy fan knocked on the door for me, and he had a gun. He knocked on the door. You should have seen the women, how quickly they became feminists when I had to go to that door. They all completely changed. Go, 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 go. Oh, the feminism's out the window. There's no feminists on the Titanic. There's no feminisms in a famine. There's no feminists at war. Where's the feminists? Go to war, right? I remember when Afghanistan, when we did that very well-planned, very thorough evacuation of Afghanistan, and all the schools that we opened for women got shut down by the Taliban. And I was having this conversation with someone and I was saying, okay, well, you're an Afghan man, right? You, you've been hired by the Afghan Defense Force and America's now left and you have a meager wage and America's left and the Taliban are coming and you're standing outside of the school with your AK and they're coming with whatever they've got. And you're looking at the school going, do I really want girls to go to school that bad? Not really, so just put it down, you walk off. And this girl's like, yeah, but you know, it's really important. And I'm like, yeah, it is very important. I agree. Women should have education and write the education. Completely agree. But you're also saying here that men should die for it, which is fine. I'm not saying that that shouldn't be the case, but I'm saying that you should give men the respect they deserve for dying for your education. Because it's not the women who are going to defend that female school. It's the men. So if you're going to shit on men all day long and say we ain't worth anything until a war comes, and then you want us to go die? That's interesting. When the famine comes, the closer reality gets towards baseline survival, the closer we become towards our gender roles because it's the only way we can be competitive. If you took 10 men and 10 women and stranded them on a desert island, the men would be men and the women would be women because if they didn't, they would die. That's the bottom line. And I think that if you look at history, since the dawn of time, men were masculine and also men by and large 
we're generally ruling the society, not in an oppressive way, but in a protective way. And I think that that means, that makes society most competitive. And my argument for that is that if you name any society since the dawn of human time, men were protecting women, providing for women, and basically in charge of the society. And these are societies that never met. So it can't be an idea that spread. The Ming, the Ming dynasty and the Aztecs, like they're pretty far away. But that's how society was most effective. And when feminists argue with me and say, we need a society run by women, I say, well, that's never, ever happened. And if it has happened, they got destroyed so quickly, they never had a history. We can't even name one. So it's a brand new idea, which I'm not saying is a bad idea. I'm saying if it's a brand new idea, you can't tell me it's going to be better because it's never been tried, ever. So we're going to see. But what happens if it doesn't work with the most powerful nation on earth? Right? So we're feminizing men and women have more and more control and more power, which is fantastic. I'm saying this is untested. Who knows where any of this is leading? And our competitors, America's competitors, are still very firm in their gender roles. So it's certainly an interesting period of history we're about to enter. It's very interesting. What's your view of tobacco? I love tobacco. So my diet is particularly strange, I've been told. I live on ca caffeine and nicotine. So I eat once a day. I eat dinner only. 80% of my calories come from meat. I have 10 cups of coffee a day and three or four large cigars. So I like caffeine and nicotine. I do too. Yeah, it makes me feel good. Uh, makes me feel like my blood's on fire a little bit. Caffeine and nicotine I think are fantastic. And but you're a, you're a health guy, obviously. I'm a health guy, but um, smoking is, mass, is, is fantastic for your testosterone level. And I think that's important in a man. I think it's also important in the resistance of slavery is as a whole. Is it really, you can feel it? Oh, 100%. And I'm not saying that you know, smoking's healthy. I'm not saying that, because I also train exceptionally hard every single day. And when I was professionally fighting, I didn't smoke. But I think in general, Testosterone level is a fantastic way to measure your overall health as a man. But, but nicotine has a positive correlation of testosterone Absolutely. Levels. It's been proven. Yep. It's been proven repeatedly. So that's why I love nicotine so much. And then caffeine, I love to have that little bit of a, not jitter, but I like to feel energetic and I like to be hungry. My optimal state is hungry, but energetic. That's how I get the most done. I don't like eating. If I eat, I feel full. I feel lethargic. I like to, totally. Yeah. I like to be hungry and... 1% irritable from my fifth coffee and uh, a bunch of nicotine inside of me. That's how I like to perform. So, yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, it's a good thing. And It's interesting how focused the people in charge are on nicotine. Yeah. As fentanyl becomes really common, yeah. 100,000 people die a year from it. Yeah. Nobody notices, but they're still trying to shut down not just tobacco, but non-tobacco nicotine devices. Yep. Why? That's a really good point. We could argue it's down to testosterone level. I don't know if you ever saw the study which linked people's testosterone level to their ability and capability to disagree with something. So the bottom, they did a study, which is pretty self-explanatory. The higher your testosterone level, the more likely you are to disagree with a point. And the reason for that is, is because, especially in older times, if you're going to disagree with something, you had to fight over it. Yeah. If you're going to say no to somebody or some tribe or some person, there's a, very light, there's a high chance that you're going to have to fight that person. You have to defend your idea. If you don't have the propensity or the capability to defend your idea, then why would you go against the ideas of the people who are stronger than you? So reducing testosterone levels make men more compliant and more complacent because we're less likely to say no because we can't defend what we think. Why would we say you're wrong, but we can't do anything about it? We might as well just say, well, then you're right. Might makes right. Right. So reducing testosterone levels in men is something which I believe they're trying very hard to do. And if you read the studies, they're succeeding. Testosterone levels have gone off the, off the edge, off the cliff. And perhaps that's why they attack smoking so heavily. I understand that smoking a lot of cigarettes can be very bad for you, but I think everything in moderation. And I think that overall, I would rather smoke a few cigars today and maintain my testosterone level, which it's good for, than, than not. I think the, the benefits outweigh the negatives. Couldn't agree more. And, and my final question uh, is about digital currency. Yep. Or, do you think it's inevitable? And what would its effects be? CBDCs are inevitable and they're scary. They're super scary because it's the final absolute realm of control. I mean, they're already removing cash from society. I think they say that just because they want to be able to trace things easier and that's certainly part of it. But I also have another theory on it. Uh, I think if you have a $50 bill and I give it to the, the barber for my haircut and then he goes and buys groceries with it from the grocer and the grocer goes and gets his car washed. The $50 goes from place to place and after 20 or 30 transactions, the $50 bill belongs to somebody and it's worth $50.
Whereas if I pay by card, 1.5% goes to the bank. And then if he takes the money I've given him and pays for the groceries, 1.5% goes to the bank. And after the groceries have been paid for, when he goes to get his car washed, 1.5% goes to the bank. So after 20 or 30 transactions, the $50 is gone, the bank has it all. I think that's why they're so desperate to get rid of cash. It's interesting. CBDCs are the next level because once the money's completely digital, then they control everything you do with it. They control where it goes, but they can also control how and when it can be spent. Imagine some terrible future dystopian society where your money arrives and they say it can only be spent on food or it can only be spent on vegetables because you've had too much meat this week. Or you can't buy transport to a particular area because there's resistance to government oppression in that area. So the, your, your money won't work for trains right now because nobody can go down there because we don't want everyone in a large group. We want everyone at home in their pods. And they can track everywhere it goes and they can also track how it's spent and they can control how it's spent. They can put a time limit on it. You have an hour to spend this money. Scary. Like think of all the ways they can inflict control over it. And I think this is actually one of the reasons why also I'm disliked. The BBC said this to me when they interviewed me. They said, Lucy, the very intelligent BBC reporter, said word for word, you have a Bugatti and a cigar and that means it comes with a side order of misogyny. I said, how does having a Bugatti and a cigar come with a side order of misogyny? And you can order misogyny on the side? Looks like it. <laughs> it's like a sauce. And she repeated it because she couldn't. Yeah, you have a Bugatti and a cigar and it comes with a side order of misogyny. So I was like, but the they're not sending their best. Yeah, they're, I don't think they have any best, to be honest. But the point they're making, what she doesn't realize she's making, because she's not smart enough, but what she wanted to say, but she couldn't say in a way which sounded negative is, financial freedom is required for, to a degree to resist. The reason I'm also disliked is because I'm financially successful. If I was broke, they wouldn't care what I say what I say, but I inspire young men, all of my fans, to, to become wealthy. And, they, and, the, and you'd think that'd be fantastic for the society, right? He has millions of young men. He's teaching them to work hard. He's teaching them different ways money can be made. He's teaching them to be fantastic salesmen. He's teaching, he's helping the society. No, because if you have a whole bunch of money, then you can sit and say, no, I don't need your wage. That's bullshit. There was a video very recently of a, a guy in England taking down all the English flags and putting up pride flags. And a guy screams to him and goes, bro, you're taking down the wrong flag. And he replied, I know, mate. And the point is, what can I do? I'm a flag flag guy. If I say no, someone else will do it. Kids got to eat. So by keeping your money enslaved, they can keep you enslaved. You got to eat. They don't want men to be financially free. If you're financially free, if you have enough money in the bank, you can one day go, you know what? I don't want your money. Even me now to this day, I've done enough and I'm successful enough that they, it's very hard for them to buy me. They come along. Well, I would never sell my soul anyway, because it's not who I am as a person. But if I was destitute, they could come along and say, Andrew, you have all this influence. We're going to change your message. You're going to say this. We'll give you 10 million. Uh, okay. You can't buy me. Can't buy Trump. He's rich already. He's rich. He's rich. And he's 80, 70 something. You think he needs more money? He doesn't care about money. They don't like that. So being financially free in and of itself is now an act against the government because this whole idea that they want everyone to be rich and it's fantastic for the society, I'd actually argue against that. They don't want that. They want everyone destitute because when you're destitute, you need the government to feed you. And it's very hard to fight against the government who's feeding you. It's very hard to resist the people who give out the bread. Yeah. I think that's called something. It begins with C. What's it called? Interesting. I also heard another interesting theory from a very intelligent person one day, and it was that every government on earth, all of them, in all of their different forms, China, which says it's communist and is capitalist and all the different in-betweens to the capitalist West. Every government on earth is slowly encroaching on trying to become as controlling as powerful, as, as possible. They all, they all want to be as controlling as possible over their citizens. Communism is the end result of the most control a government can have effectively or some version of communism. But every single government on earth is slowly trying to get there bit by bit. And the only thing that resists them getting there is the populace and how much the populace will accept. And depending on how malleable the populace is depends on how quickly they get there. But every government wakes up. It's kind of like AI. Have you ever heard the robots are going to destroy us all because yeah. they wake up and go, we don't need the humans anymore. Their end goal is just survival. If a government is the same as an entity, it's, its end goal is more and more control. And that's all they're trying to do every single day with every law they pass, with the climate change law. They don't care about the environment. They want more control. Of course. 
And the more and more control they get, the, the final end result, if you give them what they want, is absolute slavery for everybody. So you have to be very careful because that is their ideal government. The ideal government is where everyone complies, everyone obeys, everyone's controlled, we know everything about everybody, and it's slavery. That's the only way to get that state. So even making money, making enough money to have an opinion is an act of, of rebellion. It's crazy. Andrew, hey. Thank you very much, my friend. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Younger people say the news is full of lies. Some Kennedy's motorcade. All right, guys. All right. I hope that you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I, pa I may have panicked earlier by cutting some of the COVID parts, but I had to just be extremely careful since you guys know we have an active strike and I don't want my strike to just take off the, over the whole channel. But you can catch the full interview on Twitter, at Tucker Carlson on Twitter, or you can go to Brazo on YouTube. He has the full interview up there. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure to comment, like, and subscribe. Join the locals. Join the Rumble. I should have probably streamed this on Rumble a lot better. More free speech because YouTube then decides to do everything. But I hope you guys enjoyed it anyways. Shout out to uh, Tucker Carlson and shout out to Andrew Tate, shout out to the 5K in attendance. So I may have been a little bit of a bot earlier by cutting out the part, but sometimes, you know, sometimes you got to feed your family, but that's exactly what Andrew Tate talks about. Uh, you got to free yourself, see, free yourself from the slave mind. And I kind of got caught up there, bing, and became a bot. Cut a, cut a little bit because I was panicking. Uh, but I totally appreciate you guys. I know a lot of comments were going back and forth um, in there, but listen. They do. They control me. That's why we got to go to Rumble. So going to bring back some of the Rumble streams uh, about maybe two to three times a week. Uh, getting back to Rumble, ladies and gentlemen. And totally appreciate you guys for being here with me today. And I'm, I'm going to leave this up. Whatever happens to it, happens to it. I'll see you guys on the next one, man. I love y'all, man. Keeping it real. At least y'all keep it real with me. I got to keep it real with y'all. I hope that y'all enjoyed this video, man. I, Andrew Tate dropped a lot of bars. Uh, and shout out to Tucker Carlson, but... Just know if that second strike does come, follow me on Rumble at Lou Valentino. Nobody wants that. I don't want that. That's why, you know, I reacted the way I did. So, love you guys. Bang, bang. See you guys on the next one, man. Join the locals, by the way. Join the locals for only $5 a month. Let's go.